Oh, it's like a show. I'm a little nervous. I'm nervous to get started, just to get it, you know, just to just to get it done. Yeah. Once it's uh, once it gets started, it's like singing. You know, you just it's like playing any show. You know, once you're into it and the crowd is there, you're really rocking. Out. Quarter inch thick minimum grading. 
and all of a sudden it becomes three quarters to one inch of rent. So a quarter inch of free brand new steel, you leave it alone for 50 to 75 years or more, it'll give you one inch of rust on any connection that you want. And inside that connection, there's this head of a bolt, the tail of a bolt, a nut. And again, we can, you guys can come up afterwards during the quick break we're going to have and you can see. This table I use whenever I go to expert witnesses cases, and they want to know what these things look like before they hurt or kill somebody. And I have had this bolt, and I don't know if you can see it, but you look in the middle of this bolt. And so these are the things that hurt and kill you. Oh, don't worry about that. So I got plenty of rust up here for you guys to see here. Because these things are unknown. The only way to find out if we have a, a weakened bolt with 116 still left in the center is if we low test it. Otherwise, you see this much rust. Somebody has a question back? Yeah. How much longer before that completely fails and it falls off the building? A fire At that point. At the point where it's that quarter inch left. Oh, oh yeah, this is this is a sixteenth left in the middle here. Even though it's still got three eighths on this side, which is the outside head, the square head. So if you see any square head holes, they're seventy-five to one hundred and twenty-five years old. Originally put in when the, the structure went up. On average, you're supposed to change these bolts out every twenty-five to thirty-five years, and it'll satisfy the the national parks. I mean the uh, NFE, uh, NFES. And what is that? They have the law since twenty-seven. The authority having jurisdiction shall accept by a low test, which will find these, these, these pieces that are ready to go, or other evidence of strength, which means that if you change these bolts out every 25 to 35 years, whether they're good or bad, then there is no low test for the next 15 to 25 years. Why? Because you have, you have, you've, you've uh, satisfied other evidence of strength. Right? So I got plenty of, as they say, rust that we use to, uh, in court cases to show what happened just before the accident occurred? Go ahead. Um, you were mentioning that it's two bolts that came into the structure. Yeah. But in what part of the structure? There were there any considerations for what kind of damage the fire was doing to that structure that the Oh, yeah. Okay. That's a great question. So, when you speak with firemen, what, what kills people? The fire or the smoke? So, and the temperature inside there will, will cook you. So if it hits a thousand degrees inside that room. So the by the time this is ready to collapse the wall, uh, the building, nobody can survive inside that building. This is three quarter, and this is this is how you put it in the wall. Two studs. You have to put in a two by eight or two by ten blocking inside. Then the through bolt and the Antonio into the two uh, the two uh, two by fours. And then the, the plate, which is a big washer, you know, eight by eight by four or ten by five piece of plate, basically, in order for it to rip itself out, because it's not for the sheathing, it's it's got to rip two two studs with it. And if that happened, then something else is happening. There was a catastrophe that happened. Not the fire escape. The fire escape is the last thing to fail. It'll stay up until the wall collapses. You cannot and it repeats itself every four feet and five feet. So think about that. Fire escapes have a four time redundancy. That's four bolts holding it with its treads. It has four bolts, um, well, four connections at the top of the stringer, the bottom of the stringer. It's four, at least four. Every four feet is a new through bolt that goes into the building. These things are made to hold these guys up. You don't build anything. Everything you build is 40 and 60 pounds a square foot, right? Inside the building. This is 100. It's made to basically be the last thing to fall. And the ones that can use it the last is the firemen going up because they have to suit it. They can go through fire. They can, and they need just good ground. Okay, so who have we taught this class? We taught this class from Maine to Florida. And this is probably my, some of you may recognize, but I, I did this class two times already here. Okay, not uh, how, uh, how many people, but you know, we just did MCIA two, two months ago. Okay, so let's, uh, I've taught building departments, I've taught fire departments, I've taught um, uh, housing, and then I do this from Maine to Florida, Chicago to Texas, and, and from uh, Seattle to San Diego. Why? Because I've been in the business uh, this long. Let me tell you how I got hot jet. First of all, my dad's 85, still in the iron works business. And so that's why 50 years ago I got hot jet when I was 10 or 11 years old. So in 71. Is, uh, so that's my experience. I, I have to scrape and paint these things. 
Then I went to the theoretical side because when I asked building inspectors, engineers, architects for help, I needed some questions answered. There was none. So a lot of these I had to go get. Once I got so much information, I created the National Fire Escape Association. And that's what I'm doing here. Just giving you guys information. So we're saving lives one fire escape at a time. As soon as you fix one fire escape in your city, thank you. That's it. Because now you've helped save a tenant and you've helped save a fireman. If you continue on and you make it a make it a, a stand that you're gonna have your fire escape all of them inspected, and how do you know your fire escape is inspected in your city? What's well, got one of these tags? So every fire escape that doesn't have a tag, guess what? You don't know if it's yellow. I have here. I got tagged and I got red. So all these things, this is you gotta make it simple for the tenants, for the firemen, for the building inspector, as they walk underneath any fire escape from now on. Make sure that's a white, a white tag. Alright. So I've done these type of classes all the way across the country. Like I said, uh, one of my first national classes was in Seattle. And so a lot of them have done and certified the fire escape. One of my model cities here, if you guys ever want to start this program right off the bat and ask a fellow building uh, commissioner, call the city of Lowell, which we've done about five or more of these seminars specifically for them, and they have a national model. So if you want to just download it off their website, and we gave you a copy of it in, in your paperwork. Lowell is the number one. Yonkers in New York is the IFC version of the same thing, and both of them include low, low testing if it's required because the, the building has an old, old bolts on the, on the fire escape. Okay. So, you guys remember this picture, right? 72, 73, want to kill the surprise from the Herald Reporter? This is, a, this is the shot that won one of the surprise. 72, Marlboro Street. That fireman saved himself with one hand. She fell to her death. Her niece landed on her. But look how much fire escape components are coming down, especially all that gravy. In 72, IBC only says, you must maintain your fire escape at all time. Boston took it upon itself because of this. They said, hey, every five years check it. They became the only fire escape certification in the nation. Nobody else. Everybody else was maintained at all times. Put in the putting the requirement of having it certified on the owner. How many owners are maintaining all their fire escapes and then skipping rent? Right? So this went to sleep. This went to sleep again, and it, and it, and it has its cycle. It wakes, and it sleeps, and it wakes, and it sleeps, and it's usually after there's some blood on the street. The blood of a child, the blood of a fireman, the blood of a, of a worker fixing it. So we're gonna show you some great examples today of, of how this fire escape, um, how it started as a great thing, you know, with Boston having an IBC ordinance, so they changed the code in Massachusetts only, not in New England. They were the only one that had the five-year rule. That five-year rule has not changed in 2012. The IBC, I mean, the IFC has now a nationwide requirement that you certify your fire escape every five years. If your city, if your state is IFC. This all went, about 40 states took on the fire escapes through the fire prevention. 10 states, more or less, are still IBC controlling the certification of the fire escapes, okay? So we teach, we teach both sides. Anybody see the Boston Globe ad? Not a month ago. This was on the front page of the Boston Globe, and covering just fire escapes in Boston, but it represents every city, including your city, in the nation. Okay. So out of the 9,000 known fire escapes in the city of Boston, I'm going to take a guess how many of this article says are certified as we speak. One third. So 3,000 fire escapes in the city of Boston have a certificate in the lifetime of certificates in the city of Boston. The MCIA class I've had for the first time, over 20 building inspectors that showed up from Boston to the MCIA class. Primarily forced there because of the fire escape issue that this globe uh, had the, just in that same week on a Sunday. So this was the real estate section. Now, how does this apply to you? You all have the same problem. Only about a third of your fire escapes or less have ever been looked at for a different reason other than having a certificate on it. Tread fell, somebody got hurt, whatever it may be, that brought your attention not only to the building, but brought your attention to the fire escape. Okay? So, I think we give you a, a link or a copy of the, of the article there. So let's take a look at 
Let's take a look at Rusty over here. By the way, this came out of an elementary school. This fire escape was replaced. And a piece of it was so bad. And this is where children would go down every day. And this is the actual condition that I got it. Okay? Rusty over here, and it's in the other uh, counter part is uh, further down. Um, so, it was a, a private school in Cambridge. And this fire escape is the one that's there. No paint left on it. The children were eating, not eating the paint, but you know, every time they touch it going down the stairs, children, this, because this was the uh, recreational yard for the kids. Every day they went up, every day they went down. Guess who told me to replace it? Was it the building official? Was it a fire official? It was the maintenance guy. Who convinced the principal to say it? Can we change this? And so it did get changed. This is where I replaced it, right here. All right? So what I did is I took this four foot wide fire escape, I cut it in half, and what I did over here is I saved this part that went into the ground, look at all the rot. This is why when you guys get a chance to come up here during the break, it's rotting in the ground, so I saved it. The stairs going up, when I cut it and shrunk it so I can deliver it to show it like this, I welded it. I did what's called the welding witch doctor activity to it. So one half of it is done correct, the other half is not done correct, and I just took welding rods to it. Right? And the welding rod, which is illegal now, you can't weld fire escapes because that was the catch. You know how many welding witch doctors earn their income just by coming up, welding fire escapes, leave the rust, and just weld it together? Because in five years' time, you have guaranteed work because these welds would snap within two to three years because rust keeps growing and does what to these welds? Just snaps them. So this is like, it's like an annuity for these guys. You know what I'm saying? Every five years, they come in, ah, almost past. You need another three to $5,000 from you and we'll get it certified. Who's going to check? Well, nobody. You know why? In the city of Boston? You know who can sign up on these? Anybody with a G3 license. And who let them hang out in other cities? The you guys. You guys said, oh, you got a G3 license from the city of Boston? So you can sign your own certificate. That Boston document that comes on, that's online is the, to the best of our information, knowledge, and belief. Fire escape is, is in accordance with the building code. Yeah. So these welding witch doctors came in, and every five years they get some money. Oh, by the way, don't, don't forget the, uh, the orange paint is lead paint. So today, can we weld anything with lead? Burn anything with lead? You'd be able to give you a $37,500 fine. So, 99.7% of every fire escape in the U.S. ever built was with rivets, bolts, never welds. Welds don't last long on most fire escapes. So right now, if anybody's welding in New York City, it already killed two firemen in Boston. I got, I got the video to show you guys. But don't let anybody ever weld your fire escapes. The welding guys are going to give you the terrible free on pricing. A typical three-story fire escape could be to the owner who needs to get it repaired because he had somebody inspected. 3,000 for the welding witch doctors, 13,000 for an ornamental in the area that knows, a, knows what to do, but not all that needs to be done to give it a warranty. And then $23,000 for a company that's gonna give you a 25 year structural warranty. So what's that mean? What's that mean for anybody? Well, that means that these things have been fixed for 50 to 75 years with these welding rods. And they'll either burn a house down or they'll kill some firemen in Boston. Sadly, a few years ago, we killed two firemen because they were welding a fire escape. This is not the way to repair a fire escape. But I, what I did here on Rusty, and Rusty Jr. over there, I'm showing uh, you know, all the things that got done to this thing. All the wells, all the connections, all the pop bolts. You can still see the head on some of these, some of these pop bolts. So come and see what 75 years of neglect looks like since I brought it here. Oh, by the way, we have the bastard cousin here. You guys have tons of these down there. Done in down in southeastern Massachusetts. I think the guy that does this still produces these welded fire, I mean these aluminum fire scapes. And so we're going to talk about these also. Because as you know, there's a lateral load test that we have to do on some of these. Right? On the rails. We also, you know, like this thing is, we also have to have a minimum spacing on grading and thicknesses. It's a good one here, okay? Doesn't, doesn't rust though. But it's a great, oh, and these ladders. All of them are usually nine feet above grade. Not six, because you can still climb. And it's a great way to build them if you, know, if you like rivets and one eighth. 
one inch bolt with a minimum is three eighths and a half inch for steel. And, uh, and a lot of times, this is the best part. So the best part is that you guys make the ornamentals put in a three quarter bolt when this thing was removed, and that's why I kept it for this kind of show. Uh, they use a quarter inch, um, uh, we call it the molly, not molly bolt, they call it the butterfly. So it goes in, opens up, and then grabs the sheathing. And the toggle, is it a toggle bolt? <coughs> Toggle bolt is what holds a lot of these up, and the angles, instead of being two by two by quarter underneath, they're inch and a half, inch and a half by three sixteenths, the angles that support these up. And then you guys ask us to certify these things. Pre-existing don't be foreign. So we're going, we're going to another session there, but southeastern Massachusetts, you guys have these in Taunton, uh, Attleboro, Fall River, New Bedford, they're just so we have to have a decision, and a lot of times we're going to ask the state to say, hey, would I certify that? The answer is no. Can you reinforce it to a certain degree? Yeah, throw enough money at it, but you can throw money back to steel. So these, these became a very inexpensive way, and they, there's thousands of these guys, thousands. So much so that we kind of stay away from these things when they, when they call and ask for certification. Because some building inspectors play the grandfather clause. The grandfather clause says uh, it's there. So yeah, it's there, but it was built it's substandard. So we'll talk about that afterwards. All right. Let's, uh, so this is what I did to. I got it to my 85 year old father's shop. I cut it in half so I could travel with it. I did everything wrong. I welded everything. Okay. I just threw welds everywhere to show you what has been the norm because this is a three thousand dollar option. You guys understand? So you got a ton of these fire escapes. And have the three thousand dollar option for the past fifty years because it was the cheapest way in and out of this. Okay, so you have to. Right now you can't weld because of the lead paint. But aside from that, don't let anybody ever weld. It killed two firemen in Boston. Don't let it kill a family or kill anybody in your area. Welding is not is not a preferred method of repair. It's an emergency repair. So secure it if that's your only option, and then you have to fix it with bolts. If our skips are built with bolts. You got to repair it with bolts. See a bolt, take a bolt, take it up. So I did that. That's all I did here to make it a show and tell piece. This is a, this is pretty much you know what you're looking at that happens. A lot of times they leave the rust, the original bolt. They just weld the nose on a lot of these things. You know what I'm saying wherever. And sometimes they suspend it from above. They throw half inch bars, square bars underneath, and they hack the hell out of it. And guess what? None of you show up to, to inspect it. You just see this piece of paper that shows up from a structural engineer who has a rubber stamp, and he gets how many times, when he drops, how much money does he get every time he rubber stamps? Something that comes from Joe Ironworks. Right. 200 bucks. How much? 300 bucks. 200 bucks, 300 bucks. What is right? Well, I've seen guys, <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you the story, <laughs> say, hey, I need you to certify this fire skip. Yeah, they need a lot of work. Here's a grant. Yeah, let's, let's certify it. You get some paint on it. So there's a grant later. So these things are being bought. Why? Because there's no confidence test. Again, you've got a copy of the lower one. Just take this, their insignia out. Put your sit insignia in there. And then call them, talk to their, uh, talk to their commissioner who did all these classes. Um, and you can also talk to uh, their, uh, we call it council, just to make sure that there's nothing in there that's, that's in there. But they have, they have to put it through their council. I'm sure they spoke with the state also. All right, so let's keep on going. This is the weld. We call them the welding witch doctors. And they're killers. They kill two firemen in Boston. All right, so some of these other fire schemes that are certifiable at the time, when you got a rubber stamp engineer or architect, by the way, all design professionals can sign off on your fire schemes. And in the city of Boston, the, and you hold a G3 license. You know what a G3 license is? It's to, make, it's to do little railings, little window guards, and then when they ask you, Today, hey, you doing fire escapes? said, no, nope, not doing fire escapes. Only to do fire escapes later because what your G3 has led you for the past 50 years, not only full permits in Boston, but some other surrounding cities, which they don't allow anymore. And also sign up on the docket, I mean on the document that you get from the city of Boston for you to sign the certificate. It says design professional or fire escape mechanic. Guess who's a fire escape mechanic? A G3 guy. If you want to do a fire escape in Chelsea, you need to have a construction supervisor's license. Okay? 
So all the surrounding cities have pretty much put a stop to the whole that Boston still allows. G3 guys to fix it. Well, G3 guys to inspect it. Give a price. Fix it. Collect the money. And also sign off on it without a problem. They may have tried, because of that NBCIA class that I taught two months ago, they may be now saying, oh, everything needs a permit. But none of you, how many, when's the last permit anybody gave for a fire escape in this city? Look around. Nobody here has given a permit to fix a fire escape. So who has free reign at it? Well, they were stuck to this fire escape, guys. Some little right, some little wrong, and there's no double check. The double check is going to be the confidence test that has to be signed by somebody that's a third party inspector to whoever's fixing the fire escape. So it's going to be alone. That's the guys you want to copy and paste. You can start as, as early as tomorrow, you can have a certificate in your hand. To copy and paste. Questions? All right, so these are just examples. For example, this one here is at the Chelsea, Chelsea house up on the top. The Chelsea on the top. So this is hammer testing. Uh, I believe this is uh, April. Anybody notice? Uh, well, this is me doing what's called a hammer test. Hammer test. Uh, by the way, somebody asked me a question there. When do they give out? The, this this much one sixteenth fails in a hammer test. I, I use a three pound hammer, and look, I'm going to show you a video of us. So for our safety, we go off ping, 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 pong. A pong is when one of these have given way with a three pound sledge, baby sledge, it's for our safety. It's not a low test, it's a safety hammer test. Bang, bing, bing, bong. We go pong, 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 and then they go like that. The more rust it has. So who's, in, who's that gonna hurt? Tennis going up and down. Firemen going up and down. And a lot of times they get these firemen going down. Because if they go going up, it fails, the foot goes through, they fall forward to the fire escape. Well, you know what happens when they're wearing 200, 300 pounds of total, total weight? They come down and they step on that tread. It gives way, their leg goes through, and they snap their knee forward, not backward. I've had my first case was a fireman who fell through three treads. That failed. Landed one floor below, came back up, saved some leg, but at the end of it all, he had permanently uh, damaged his spine. So, this is pretty much, you know, this type of non-repair, but that's city hall in Cable. Back in the day, I'm sure they fixed it back today. But uh, how many trends are missing on that, on that, uh, on that right there? So where is it? It's in city halls. It's in city buildings. It's also on fire training towers. And I shut down fire training towers. As a matter of fact, I, I low tested the first fire tower in the nation in the city of Oakland. They're the number one safest fire tower. And what happened just across the bay? A fireman got blown off the fire escape because of the pressure, you know, the, the, the uh, standpipes. So after that, most towers shut down in, in, for training until they, they uh, changed, uh, in, uh, upgraded their rims from 36 to 42. To stop that kind of event. Oakland was the first. San Francisco, even though I had five, still hasn't upgraded their system or low tested it. So, there it is. This is actually Walt Demo Watertown. Okay? This is what they were training firefighters on at their, and this is right at their location, the fire station. I think it's Walt Demo Watertown. Anybody recognize this fire station? Oh, this tower? No. So I went in, I inspected inside. See the rest? This is on the inside because they get a lot of water, a lot of smoke training inside. You see uh, uh, the rust, the gussets here? How about the treads I knocked out with my ping hammer? Okay, so I shut this down. See the, the, the caution tape there? All right, they shut down. So what happened? How did these give way? Well, because they all look like this. And it's been 50 to 75 years. In some cases, 75 to 125 year olds, they can't take the hammer. Or they're used as a pierce. So you can use this to write in calligraphy if you wish. So, and a lot of times, I'll, be, I'll use this one as an example. Look, look how much rust is between these two plates. That's a gusset. And so, what's, in, what's that hole look like inside? Well, I 
because I sadly have to be an expert witness a lot of times, the uh, jury, the jury has to see, the, you know, the progression of rust. Okay. So with that, shut that down. This was the case of the fire escapes up in Chelsea, the Chelsea Homes. This is my inspection of the Chelsea Homes. You know when they finally got to it? It's a state, it's a state bill, it's a state of it. Funding this, but the, you know, the, if the hand grenades and bullets didn't kill you as a veteran, fire escape almost, almost got you. information about this fire escape that collapsed in the Fenway neighborhood. Two people were hurt when they fell all the way to the ground. And city records show that the building's owner hasn't filed a required safety inspection certificate since the late 1980s. We asked a fire escape expert to take a look, and he says this could be just the tip of the iceberg. It was just before midnight Sunday. Some of the gratings on this fire escape on the back of 47 Hemingway Street gave way. Several people were on it. Two of them were hurt when they crashed to the ground. I see that there's a missing bracket, a single bracket that used to be tied into the rail, and it gave way, and I believe that's why pieces of the grating fell. Cisco Manessis is the founder of the National Fire Escape Association. We asked him to look at the aftermath of the collapse. You can see where the bracket he's talking about used to be, and you can see the spot on the wall where it once was attached. He blames rust caused by a lack of maintenance. The rust is what eats the steel, and I believe, based on what I can see right now, she's rotted right at the, at the building. Why wasn't that caught? There is no evidence the fire escape was inspected and safety certified. Right now, a lot of these fire escapes, if they're not being properly uh, inspected and repaired, what happens is we have collapses like this. Building owners in Boston are required to have their fire escapes certified every five years and file that certificate with the city. But when we searched the database for Boston's Inspectional Services Department, we found no certificates on file, at least since the late 1980s. A violation a building inspector has now cited the owner for. The inspector's report orders the owner to, quoting now, provide a fire escape and fire balcony affidavit forthwith. There's more here on this other side that I can show you. Just a short walk down the alleyway, Manessis found this fire escape with holes in the brick where support brackets are anchored. There's three, four supports not even tied into the building anymore. There's gaping holes this big. He says it's not uncommon for owners to skip inspections or for private inspectors to gloss over problems. Because a lot of people, they collect a fee, 200, 300 bucks for a piece of paper. Nobody's checking. And so what happens is these are landmines ready to explode. Rumbling crash I'd ever heard. It was Laura O'Brien's first time standing on the makeshift balcony with two roommates during a party they threw for a friend's birthday. But the celebration quickly turned tragic. My arms went over my head. It, it, I went down, straight down so quickly. O'Brien survived the fall but broke her back when other roommate was also seriously injured. I could hear my roommate Nancy yelling. Albert Sue was not so lucky. First thing I thought was that's not possible. Sue's oldest brother, Min, spoke with us through tears. I lost my brother. Albert was just 22 years old. It's his fire escape. Those don't fall off. Then on April 11th, three months later, City Council's Committee on Public Safety held a hearing on the collapse. It is a statement to me that our fire professionals won't even use fire escape. When it comes to a fire, the last thing you'll ever use is the fire escape because they have not been maintained. They leave the rust inside. Look at the weight. That chain gives away. What's going to happen to your head? Cisco Manessis, who inspects fire escapes for a living, points out how wires prevent this escape ladder from even coming down. The entrance is obstructed with flower pots, and the stairs are rusted. These things are very dangerous. They are collapsing. 
They haven't been maintained. Touring Portsmouth, where most buildings are well over 100 years old, it's easy to find crumbling and rusted out fire escapes. So I inspect nationwide, and on average, 75% of everything I inspect has not been maintained in at least 50 years. He says three out of four fire escapes fail inspection. Meanwhile, New Hampshire is one of a few states that doesn't even have a mandatory five-year fire escape inspection law. Manessas, who teaches fire safety, several years ago advised Oakland officials of the fire hazards in old warehouse buildings like the Ghost Ship Warehouse. That's where tragically 36 people died on December 2nd. Most were stuck on the second floor. They had an egress issue. There was no fire escape on the outside. It turns out the Ghost Warehouse hadn't been inspected in 30 years. A major reason the Oakland City officials are now being sued by victims' families. Since that tragedy, Portsmouth City officials have stepped up their inspections. Soho, designed to save lives, claimed one when a metal section came loose and fell on two people. It may not look like much, but it weighed an estimated 150 pounds. Fatally struck in the head was 58-year-old Richard March Hart of Garden City, Long Island. As they mourned, Work crews were back where it happened, erecting scaffolding on the sidewalk and keeping people back, while inspectors were seen jumping up and down on fire escape landings and steps to test if they held. That one looks like it's fine. Like, you wouldn't look at it twice. Looks like it's in good shape, so. But it wasn't. Obviously not. Investigators say it was a private inspector who accidentally dislodged the piece of metal that hit not only March Hart, but a young female artist. She was seriously injured by the metal. She was on her way here to a studio at the New York Academy of Art on Franklin Street. The smoke, the flames, and the frightened faces. All in a firefighter's line of duty. But Chief William Hitchcock remembers the night. It wasn't the fire that almost stopped him. Oh, I was scared to death. <laughs> but the fire escape that broke underneath him. Where well, the railing just came away from the building. And our investigation found across Massachusetts, more unsafe fire escapes. Rusty, deteriorating, crumbling, broken. And what state officials didn't know, the system they set up to keep fire escapes safe is also falling apart. The potential ramifications are disastrous. So let's look at this one. This expert iron worker is licensed to build, maintain, and inspect fire escapes. So then over here? For months, we examined dozens of them with alarming results. Looking at this today, would this pass inspection? No. In dormitories, at theaters, at homes, at apartment buildings. Rust is actually eating away the metal of the Correct. fire escape. Correct. And the bottom line? It'll get weak and then eventually it'll fall. This one has rotted connections. This one missing bolts, twisted metal. Would the stairs come down? No, never come down. This one, a broken tread. So how dangerous is it for the people inside this building? This fire escape is definitely going to put somebody either in the hospital or it's going to put somebody at a, in a cemetery. Fire escapes are so critical. The state building code requires they be certified for structural adequacy and safety every five years. But our investigation found that safeguard is simply being ignored. Here's proof. We chose fire escapes at random in Boston, Somerville, Cambridge, Worcester, and here in Quincy. We checked building department files. But there's no fire escape certification. Not in this file. To see if building owners had submitted their mandatory inspection reports. But there's no certification in this one either. Right. Bottom line, not one we checked in Quincy had been certified as safe. And the director of inspectional services admitted because of staffing shortages, the city has no idea how many other fire escape owners are breaking the rules. And as a result, do you know how many fire escapes in your city are safe? or not? Well, I don't know. In Worcester, not one we checked was certified. In Somerville, no. Nope. four more fire escapes. Did it fall through the cracks? Yeah. Not one up-to-date certification. And again, no system for keeping track. I, How can they get away with that? Be, I guess that the shortest answer of all is because we don't have the resources to sit here and follow up on these things. If structural deficiencies are reported, local building inspectors can actually evacuate residents until repairs are made. Would you talk to us on camera about this? No. But when we surveyed two dozen more communities, most admitted they had no idea how many fire escapes were certified. In Taunton, inspectors told us they haven't seen a certification in 25 years. Northampton officials said it's a cold day in hell when that happens. 
in Cambridge, too. Not one of our test buildings was certified, and the official in charge would not come out to discuss it. In Boston, where there are more than 8,000 fire escapes, again, according to inspectional services, not one we checked was certified. Officials know they are required to enforce the building code, but they admit they don't always know if owners are breaking the law. The building code is being ignored. Right, but it's difficult to write a violation when you don't have knowledge of something like that. But state officials say for a critical issue like this, communities should know. And they warn the Massachusetts building code is not optional. Does it worry you that these fire escapes are not being certified? This is an important issue and should not be ignored. That's because after the smoke and flames begin, it'll be too late to learn you've got no way out. I can't stress it enough, Hank, that these things have to be maintained and, and someone's got to be watching. As a result of our investigation, state officials will now issue an alert to local inspectors. Meanwhile, if there's a fire escape on your home or office, you can contact your local building department to make sure it's properly certified. In the newsroom, I'm Hank Phillippe Ryan. So, by the way, that was my evil twin brother 20 years ago. So, this is 20 years ago that we did this. And the reason she did it was the station night fire. You guys all remember the station night fire? That's the reason she said, hey, I want to tell people there's other ways out. You know, be safe in case there's a fire, just use your fire escape. When I tell her that over 75% of every fire escape I've ever inspected in the nation fails, fails the certification process for lack of maintenance. The majority of those, 75%, <coughs> are original hardware, tons of rust going in it. But 25% of those have life safety issues, immediate life safety issues, or imminent safety hazards. Okay, so we've been doing this for a long time. You guys have a great, one of the best IBC. How many of these five-year rules anywhere? It's only a handful of states that follow this, and not well, because the IBC has been holding hostage the fire escape certification process for 100 years. And because it only affects tenants and firemen, how many deaths in the hundred years can we attribute to a building inspector falling or getting killed? So in 2012, the IFC took it over, finally said, oh my God, this is killing firemen and tenants, or injuring them at least, right? And who's been taking care of it? The IBC, not well, you must maintain your buildings at all times, which means it's up to the owner to maintain their fire escape at all times. So you guys in 72, you guys put in the five-year rules. And it was 1030 back then. Anybody remember 1030? The maintenance of fire escape was 1030. Now it's one of them, All exterior bridges, steel or wooden stairways. How many of you are certifying your wood stairways, which on average can only last 25 years well-maintained to 35 years with some metal reinforcement on it? Forget nails. Nails just open up all day long. But if, you got, if you've got uh, uh, gussets and you've got screws, so, and those boxes, those wood staircases, and sometimes deck merit, have to be replaced 100% every 25 to 35 years. That's the lifetime of PT. Some of these things are regular pine, just kept just being kept painted. And we taught by the time the carpenters ants get to it, and the termites, yes, question. By the way, guys, raise your hands, I can talk all day long. Oh, is it only no, 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 wait, I'm, I'm still reading, guys. Sorry. All right. So all exterior bridges, what's that? Anything that takes you over something. So you got a little brook in your house, and so that bridge, going to your boat, it's called a bridge. Anything that takes you from, that is a pathway for anybody is a bridge. Egress valve, I mean, steel wood stairways, you guys know the fire escapes is now mentioned. And then egress balconies, the crossovers, right? Shall be examined in our tested. What's the word tested mean? There should be a definition here. If you can't find this definition, let me tell you where it lays. It lays in the NFPA. 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 Since 27, 1927, the authority having jurisdiction shall accept by low test 
or other evidence of strength, which means, hey, I've changed all my bulbs every 25 to 35 years. Get the thing painted. I silicone shut all the connections, which you couldn't do back when silicone wasn't around, because you have to have a World War II to right then to create caulking in silicone. Okay? So now today's market is finally get some caulking aside from just from just um, let me show you something. Aside from just uh, paint, all fire escapes, heat and heat and this is a nice bolt, right? That's why fire escapes are made with bolts and ribbons. It heats up in the summer and does what? Does what to my paint? Cracks it, lets the water and air come in to, for us to build. Rust. So when it heats, it needs to do this. When it cools, it needs to do this. And so what happened when it over which, you know, Massachusetts area has a lot of, a lot, it's one of the top areas, not the top, but there's a lot of earthquakes here that are much smaller than California, but, and they do this also. Wind does this. But as soon as they come in and weld it, what happens to my connection? Can anybody hear a welder? Well, they weld, snap. Bolts stretch, but they still allow but if you get enough rust in the inside, it eats the shaft. It does not eat the head. It does not eat the nuts. But in the middle, what do we got? A thin down bolt. So this is what you guys got to remember is why fire escapes are bolted, not welded. And anybody that comes in and takes an old fire escape and, and shuts it, shuts it down with welds without removing the rust. By the way, you think these guys who weld remove the rust? Whenever they got a problem, you can see right here, the guy has a 3 8 rod because there's so much space between the metal to the metal. They bridge it. So they bridge and they weld the tread, and then they weld the other side of the round rod on the other side. And what happens inside with all that rust? It stays there and grows 24-7. All right, so, and this is the NFPA. The authority having jurisdiction is, you know, 1,001.7.2, so if you want to look it up, shall be permitted and approve any existing fire escape there that has been shown by load test or other satisfactory evidence of strength. Why are we even talking load test? Well, we're talking load test because 75% of the load test is for the outside. And by the way, if you have new bolts, there is no load testing for 15 to 25 years. But the piece that goes back into the building over here, which you can't see, which is usually 8 to 12 inches deep, full of rust, and any water coming from the roof down between bricks, and that half inch spacing of the veneers of the, the main structure, guess what it's doing? It's rusting the fire escape from the inside out. And a load test will catch a connection in the building. What about the danger of it? Well, if this connection repeats itself every four feet, like those girls that fell to the ground. One, she fell 30 feet. The other, two of the people in that situation jumped into the window. The connection, that T-bar that came out of the wall that was holding two gradients that were sharing it, that rod is on the inside out. And as soon as that connection let go, she and another person, one fell to the roof below, and she fell 30 feet. With greater, she came on the way down. She survived. That's why there's a lawsuit as we speak today. So let's take a look. Excuse me, who did that girl sue? Oh, good question. So first of all, they can't sue you guys because this is a third party. It's supposed to be a third party inspection. All the liability is on, on the owner. As I understand, it's the, the owner's responsibility Correct. to have the certified year certification, not us. We have to approve what is being presented to us to have it certified. But it's the owner. It's yeah, it's all on the owner. Yeah. Every well, one of these. It's not on us. No, no, not at all. You guys are. It's a all, all five year certification is on the owner. And this owner not having any certification since 84 is now in a lawsuit. They're just, they're just trying to negotiate it over because it's already lost. By the way, in certain cases, your insurance company is not going to pay this because you didn't have what the law requires and have to maintain your fire skipped in five year certification. Oh. So just so you know, uh, as a matter of fact, my, my uh, first case that I did the fireman down in New York, Two things. He was, he was suing to get better better compensation from the fact that he got hurt on an accident, right? Um, but then he sued the owner directly and settled and won simply because this wasn't a, a, an accident that occurred during a fire. This happened to him because the owner did not maintain the fire escape as required by law. 
Otherwise, a certified fire escape has never hurt or killed anybody. A properly certified fire escape. Because there is some fire escapes out there that are not. You have a piece of paper in your, on your records that's false. Go ahead. Something else. Closing. I'm going back to the previous slide because my question is talking about Negro's balcony. Yeah. So, any balcony. In, Cali in California, you guys, you guys know that uh, Berkeley collapse, where everybody, uh, there was like 25 kids, or seven died or nine died on the ground. In all of California right now, they have a law, SB 721, all exterior wood-based structures up to balconies must be inspected every six years now. So a lot of these codes pop up when there's blood on the street. So, but yes, so if it's a Romeo and Juliet balcony and it's exposed, all exterior, ready? Right? All exterior, steel and wooden stairways, balconies, bridges, balconies, bridges, fire escapes and egress balconies, correct? I mean, that yes. specifically says egress balconies. <laughs> right, so this is it's just about, yeah, it's called an area of refuge. So if you're going to use that to wait for firemen to show up with a ladder, because most likely, most of our balconies in Boston were built to cross over. Firewalls can cross over, kick their window in, and we get the safety. So if all of a sudden you're going to use an area of refuge, if it's outside, then it must be maintained. And this covers it all, depending on how you want to look at it. So if you're going to stand on a balcony of any kind outside, it should be inspected by somebody. If you don't want to give it to the 1001.3, then give it to somebody else. This is IFC, by the way. So now since 2012, Every fire escape in the U.S. must have a five-year warrant, uh, five-year inspection, and low tested. All right. So in 2012, now how many states do you think today have adopted this thing that came out in 2012 on the IFC side of things? Twenty. California now in January is finally going to be forcing the entire state to inspect every fire escape. New York doesn't. New York City. They're, they're their own empire. So just because it hits the state doesn't mean that the local cities are adopting it. So when you, when you overlap all the codes, testing and certification every five years on the international side, the NFPA says the authority having jurisdiction shall approve by low testing. And then when you use the National Building Code, it's testing and certification, obviously the fire station shall be examined or tested. So unless you overlap all three codes, the word testing has fallen to Way behind. Okay? So, how many here have ever had any fire escape in this city while testing? One over there. Two. Anybody know this? You can use this whenever your uh, OSHA code requires. This is going to fall to the vendors who are doing the work there. All exit routes must be maintained during construction, repairs, and alterations. What's this mean? This means that if they're going to pull a permit with you on any, on any building, the first thing they must present you, or it could be the last thing they present you, but it's the first thing they present you so they can do their permit, is that the two means of egress have been certified on that. They have their front stair, and they also have the second, which is wood or steel. It must be certified before, before you guys issue a certificate, I mean a permit. So this is one way you can immediately stop the process and to say, okay, you're pulling a permit, and whether it's a $10,000 contract, uh, permit or it's a hundred thousand dollars, you say, have you certified your second means of egress if it's exterior, steel or wood? And they'll say, no, I'm going to do it afterwards. So you can say, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to issue this permit, but put up some scaffolding now as your second means of egress, because that's all it says here. During repairs or alterations, employees must not occupy a work list unless the exit routes required by this summer are available and the existing fire protections are maintained or until alternate fire protection is furnished that provides an equivalent level of safety. That be a fire watch, maybe. To be the building commissioner and the fire guy to say, what are we going to do with this building that is partially being renovated or totally renovated? And this is what you got to do, residentially or commercial. Just create another means of egress, which is a certified uh, staircase put in by the guys who do this kind of work, and that's a three-foot stairway. And there's the the ones for vendors. Vendors have the 24-inch one because the building is empty, so they'll put up the scaffolding. If the building official and the fire official agree to it, they'll put in the 24-inch wide stairs. For, the, for, for people to get out. Otherwise, there's no two means of egress and you issue a permit on it. So this is one of the ways to start processing certifications is uh, don't 
open a permit until they give you proof that they got alternative, then this, this, will, this will help with OSHA. Or at the end, like Boston's doing, to close a permit, guess what you need? Certification. So you change the bathroom or the toilet, pull a permit on it, and guess what, now you're, now, now this trigger. So there's various ways that you can trigger, but permits is one of the ways at the beginning they have to prove they have two means of egress for the current tenants, for the firemen who are going to arrive, or it's going to be at the end, okay, to close the permit. All right, so technical assistance. This is a fire escape must be examined by design professionals or others acceptable to the building official. What is another? Here's your technical assistance. It's somebody that's in the, in the business. It's somebody that has uh, unique uh, prepared by qualified engineers, specialists, laboratory, or fire safety specialty organization, acceptable to the fire code official to then analyze the fire safety properties and design operations using the building of the premises and facilities and appurtenances that are situated. The fire code official is authorized to require design submittals by, uh, to be prepared by a bare stamp of a registered professional design, uh, design professional. It could be an architect or engineer, meaning if you have somebody you trust, that can certify the fire safety as a specialty organization, and for some reason, you can have them peer reviewed by a design professional. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of times, you'll pick a structural engineer uh, as, a, as a peer review. Question so far. More machine gun information? Yes. 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 Ready? All right. Oh, the old, the great uh, grandfather. How many people here still have grandfather? Or are, are you now a grandfather? So this grandfather clause is really Lawfully non-conforming. And so what is lawfully non-conforming? Well, that currently in some of your cities, or every one of your cities, that's lawfully non-conforming. A fire escape certified by a simple letter, and this is all the letter says from a structural engineer. I have shown up inside, I have collected this check. And to the best of my information, knowledge and belief, which is my parachute, so I've never seen any of you in court. The fire escape is in accordance with the mass building code. What about tomorrow? Pay me again, I'll be back tomorrow. So that's the greatest escape clause. You'll never take it anybody to court. You're the best. And that's on the, you go to Boston and you get that certificate from the state. That's all it says in there. To the best of my information and knowledge, I believe the fire escape is in accordance with the mass building code. You sign it at the bottom as an engineer, or you sign it at the bottom as an ornamental ironwork guy who fixed it and signs off on his own work with no permit, and you guys didn't do any final inspections. So some of these are in your city, and some of these are rubber stamping after they show up, and if something is falling, Put it back up and take it in both sides of your pockets. So if you run a hundred feet of cable, you go. Collect three thousand, sometimes five. Three to five thousand for these visits. That's why the most expensive, cheapest guy out there is the welding witch doctor. Because only he knows what he's going to weld the face. He spends about a day, but he makes three to five thousand a day. And does he call a fire permit for the welding? On these hundred year old structures. Well, they killed the fire. Yes? Does the National Fire Escape Association have a list of certified inspectors? Do you know who the certified inspectors are? Everybody that's in your city. You know how many of them want to follow rules? So the answer is no. What we do have is we have people that we work with that will give you a 25 year warranty on their repairs, structural. Somebody else has to keep it painted, meaning the owner or the owner. So that's the problem right now. None of them, because they've been for 50 years out there on this. But some of the people that we certify, right, they're called our A, our A group. Their tickets, whenever they speak with you at the city level, is that they're going to give you a 25 year warranty on the structure. So a new bolt, everything's sealed, and they'll come back in 20, for the next 25 years, and it'll pass, guaranteed to pass. Or they'll fix it for free. So, who are those guys? Well, we can tell you some of those guys who really are trained by the National Fire Escape Association. So that's that's your question. But it's a handful. 
because everybody else in the V and the C side of things, sadly, they don't want anybody to fire them. If the building officials are not watching me, why am I going to have you guys? Why are you know, self-declared police? Right? Why am I going to have you guys? You know what I'm saying? So it's, uh, and this is just starting now. Don't forget, the guys that have been fixing your fire skates in your area have been the local ornamentals within, you know, 10 to 25 miles. And they've come in with their welding machine. They've come in with some of the bolts. So what you guys are doing right now is changing. And how do you change? It's that certificate that you have from bolts. You have to fill that out. You know that's a legal document. It says you left no rust inside of these connections as an observer, as an inspector, as a design professional. So should something happen in the future, that document that you have to fill out is what binds you back to the court and to those people who got hurt. Did I hope they answer your question? <coughs> Unstated. If you have any tags out there, the tags are when people are uh, looking at price savings at prototypical tags. If that's what you talked about 10 years ago. But as far as tags that say that you can't, you can't go in and say that price savings. There's been no examination. So that's the only that's the only thing you can't tag. And you can't just walk down an alleyway and say, hey, these price savings are not certified. So if you go back and I don't have something to give you any of those tags and if you have them, those would be great. But any, anybody who's tagging a Farscape as an awareness tag is different than somebody saying your Farscape is not certified. That, that is not good. Okay? So what's, what's, what's lawfully not conforming? This is lawfully not conforming. There's no bars here. But the way they built it 50 to 75 years ago. Lawfully not conforming. What's, what's lawfully not conforming? Two lines. Not a rail, without rail, without any pictures. But when we certify a fire escape, we certify it as the day was installed. Because if fire escape was installed 75 years ago, I got to certify it that day. There's no requirement for it to have railing. It's got a 42 inches high. There's no, there's no upgrades of any kind. You're not going to 42, the bars that are 8, you can't make them 4. Pre existing non conforming means every fire escape I look in in any city is pre-existing non-conforming the day it was installed. Can the owner voluntarily put bars and raise the height? The answer is yes. Can you force them? The answer is no. Any questions on that? So they call it, they grant, I'm grandfathered in. If this was built wrong 50, 75 years ago, you don't get it. So wrong systems should not, uh, don't get grandfathered in. Okay, question? In the back, no? All right, let's get going. So, guys, all exterior, bridges, steel wooden stairways, fire escapes, egress balconies, and a lot of times egress balconies are the ones that cross over, fire, crossing a firewall. Okay? So let's take a look. Fire escapes here. A lot of these, these are parking garages. Fire escapes here. You guys see this one? I think this is one either in Taunton Hall, River, or Bedford. This is an all aluminum fire escape. Pretty good. Got stairs over here. You know, so we're coming to examine the stairs so you know what's going on. Compared to Rusty, this Rusty is probably 75 plus years old. Okay, so this came off one job. Kept it for this specific class. Southeast Mass. Posts are supposed to be on a frame. This post is secure to be secure. comes in, has been told that the fire escape's no good. Their design engineer says, we're going to build you design a new one with structural aluminum. You're going to build a new one structural aluminum? With structural aluminum. Okay, yeah. You, I, are you, I, I mean, I'm hearing, I know about those, what you're talking about, but a lot of the structural ones that are using structural aluminum that I'm seeing, yeah. I mean, 
Yeah. yeah. They're, I mean, I feel strong that they're better for corrosion. What's your take on it? Because I'm hearing mismeshes when you're talking about yeah, comparing no that type of unit with what I'm seeing being done. Right, just Correct. that type of unit. There is aluminum fire escapes built structurally sound. So here's the, uh, the, so first of all, you're allowed to build all fire escapes with metal. Aluminum is metal, metal is metal, right? So they're allowed. You can also build a fire escape to match the building type. So if you've got a wood structure, you can actually put in a fire escape made of wood, and it just has to have a nominal thickness of two inch, which is the inch and a half. Is that a true statement? Right? So that's a true statement. So the fire escape here, and I, I examined this fire escape, guess what holds into the wall? Black bolts. And we brought this up, I think it's in Taunton, or Fall River, this fire escape. Built down here in this area. This is still people. So the key is, is it through bolted with a through bolt? Half inch, three, seven, uh, five eighths, or, or three quarter. This one was lagged. So that's all it needed. The rest of it is fine. That's that. So can you build a little bit of fire escape? The answer is yes. So let's put a fire. Let's put a fire right here. Anybody know the melting point of aluminum? Yeah. 1,000 degrees. More like The melting point of iron? 3,000. 3,000. Right? Most fires where the window finally blows out, and we got a little barbecue going on out this window. Right? So I believe I like aluminum. But a fire comes out at 3,000 degrees. This will fight it. This, this will melt. That's the only thing. So you got to get out for it. So I'm not against aluminum. But if you build it, and a majority of you guys have this, all residentials. This was the answer to turn your two family into a three family out of the attic, which is what was the answer? In some cases, stare, but come and check the bolts on this thing. They're all one eighth. I got ribbons here, guys. And then if you look, Back to the wall, it's a hot ribbon on the top, which is like a sixteenth, and then and then these brackets that hold your physical body to the wall. Look how big they are. I think it's maybe an eight, three sixteenths. But these these uh, the bolts here are just an eighth off and through. Whereas mandatory, every single bolt here, the treads must be at least three eighths minimum. So there's only two sizes of these iron bars here. Three eighths and half inch bolts. And welds, by the way, because you're going to have a ton of your fire escape. How do you negate a weld? If I don't like any weld on anything that I'm looking at, how do you negate it? Just add a bolt. I don't care about the weld anymore. As soon as you drill a hole through a clip of a tread and you put a three eighths bolt in there, two on either side, you don't, you're not, you don't have to open up the weld. You're not going to do anything. Unless inside the connection is what? Rust. Then they have no choice but to cut whatever remaining while there is, separate thing, remove all the rust. Because rust eats the clip, rust eats the seat channel, rust eats the clip, it both sides. This, this, it gives to both sides. Okay? Okay? Fire safety. Some of the tallest ones, Chicago, 40 stories. 20 stories is the average. Here in Massachusetts, probably 15 feet, 15 stories. Maybe one thing to note, and especially if you go back to the last slide, is the difference between a full second degree and a fire escape. If you go back to that last the fire escape, I remember well because that's equal to the forward. Okay, and that was a series of three buildings. There were 12 to 15 units in compromise in those three buildings. And we required that we put in a full second degree press. Right. Our fire escape, as you mentioned, is totally different. And for me, Existing aluminum, it's, it can only, there's only three things that can happen. Okay? You can certify it on septic, okay? you, can, you can fail certification, you're putting in septic means being rest, or you are to be on If it's a legal conforming existing fire escape, then you can make repairs on it. But if it's legal non conforming, no repairs of any type. You're actually not conforming. So Let's add uh, windows should become doors. There's all these things that, that happen. So here's somebody that has dealt with this, 
And what he's saying is a fire escape usually can handle one e egress. Third floor attic space, and you create some sort of fire escape. There's no ladders, ladders are not allowed. Everything must be full set of staircases, maybe two feet wide, eight day rise and run. Only if you're covered by wildlife. Right. So the fire escape is for one, one of the three stories, because the other two stories have an internal. A full piece of egress, if you're coming from the third, you're coming from the second, you're coming from the first, and it's got to be, a lot of times, egress is going to be 36 inches wide, 7 11 rise and run all the way around. So a lot of these residential single family homes that then became two families and all of a sudden squeezed themselves into three families, primarily picking up the attic. This was the answer for the past 70, 50 to 75 years. Am I correct? Okay. Let's keep looking at this here. Still fire escapes, right? Still fire escapes. Oh, what about these? Are uh, these still fire escapes? Which means this is what the fireman has to go and get you. So it's called an area of refuge. Uh, outside, all exterior, steel wooden balconies, bridges, right? Fire escapes. So these are going to get inspected under this 101001. Somebody want to say yes? That's either state or some, anybody just, oh, we got a nod, yes. All in favor? What's your name? Bob. Bob says. Everybody, yes. Yeah. yeah. All right, so again, how about hotels that have these long walking balconies, egress systems that get people off the hotel room? Uh, this a fire escape or an egress system? All in favor? Needs of egress. How about these things? So all these wood in the back of a house, that's the only way out? How many cities? that are currently in, in, in inspecting their wood structures in the entire state, and I'm involved in this, maybe five. Reading is one, and we're going to make Reading or, you know what I'm saying? There's only a handful that are even acknowledging wood. Okay. I don't think that's, some of the guys in the room, uh, you know, requiring certification for those. I know I am. Just started. Past five years, right? Prior to that, we never touched the wood. People would say, "Okay, hey, hey, no, that's not what the building official wants. This little aluminum thing up here—that's all they want." They said, "Yeah, but this is on the second floor, under the first floor. It's seven feet or eight feet off the ground, onto a deck, and then it's just that these people use this deck to get out." And you know how many decks can be pushed at least another five years if you Frankenstein it with metal and got the straps and stuff? A lot. But that's. But then you give them the warning as a building official. Say, hey, you know, uh, somebody else is signing off on the on, on this. But in five years, I want a brand new one here, or go to metal. But otherwise, yep, you can go to wood. But you better replace this in five. So it's almost like a, a reprieve thing. I'll let it go. But I, I see a lot of metal and a lot of screws. No more nails. No more machine guns. You know how many times I've seen machine gun fire, uh, wood deck wood systems and the guys. Eight nails in a connection somewhere at the end, and then um, freezing thought just like to the whole thing. Out. All right, so so you guys, so these are going to get done for that one. Okay, let's do that part. How about how about these? This is in the back and spirals and these decky things. Yeah. So is, is this egress? The, the question in there, I can't tell if that's a single family dwelling or not. We can't do the single family dwellings. Oh, some, somebody from the state one or somebody from the state. All exterior steel wood but stairways. You, Did they mention for one family, two families? Or exactly. is this an exterior? If the code's in the IBC, it's not in the IRC. Okay, so somebody can answer that question for you. I, again, I, I get told one thing. One ten instructions. Specifically. Unless right. I'm Paul there. Right. I'm Paul there. Yeah, you know that. I see it. Now it's the ballgame. But I'm not going to go right around looking at one or two family homes. So anything that's one or two, you guys, unless you call them. Unless you call them. <laughs> Separate code, right? So I'm just saying, just leave one and two alone for a while. Just keep it on three families and up. Okay, all right? So unless the building inspector is made aware. So should the inspector, structural engineer, registered architect, or certified fire escape engineer, right? Should they notify the city if they are doing an inspection, and we're called out there for an inspection, maybe because there's metal on the right side, for example. Should we tell you guys that there's a wood in the back, including a deck, that is egressing that floor that's 8 or 10 feet above? Should we tell you guys? 
okay, well, tell us to tell me that then. Because we get told by the owner, no, he didn't say anything about it. He said this, 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 this only. Don't look, don't, do not look behind the curtain. Right? All right, let's keep looking. So spirals, you, want, you guys want us to do it's primarily steel spirals, very few in the wood outside. Uh, you want us to tell you about the steel, uh, the steel spirals that are also acting as a second reason of ingress? On three and above, or sometimes on ones and twos? Inspect those two? All exterior? All right, let's do those. How about handicap ramps that only go up five feet on average? You want us to tell you about these? They're egressing out of these. You want us to tell you about handicap ramps? All exterior steel wooden stairways? Want me to tell you about this? Just say no. Right, we are. It's an egress. Yeah, it only goes up five feet, you know, to get to whatever door it is. Do you want handicap ramps to be? I inspect these. For substandard activity, a lot of no wood. Some of them are cement and steel, but primarily a lot of wood. And again, maintain it. The key is like a dumb name. If this is maintained, somebody's going to get hurt coming down this thing. It's only five feet. So metal, steel, and a lot of these get put in homes uh, for a period of time when somebody's handicapped in the home for a period of time. Old people, they rent these things out, and then the company takes these and puts them somewhere else. Inspect these. No, nope, say no. Don't, don't inspect them. Should we warn you about those that are back? No, no, what just happened? I know this is in this is installed by different companies. These are rented units. I'm just saying, you want us to inspect this wood, like this wood one. You want us to inspect that. That's that's a key. At a home, whatever, for whatever reason, we're inspecting fire escapes on the back and the fire escape on the back. There's a lot of these single family homes out there, but it's a true family renting out the second floor. And in some cases, some of these single family homes out there are very true families where the attic space has this huge thing and they suck a fire escape on it. And we're called in to certify this. So we don't just inspect the fire escapes that are commercial. We get called for one and two, I mean, primarily two family and three family all the time for the city to show that for certification. So we don't just show up and say, hey, I'd like to. We are called because some sort of violation in this room. So, can't watch. How about these these things, these staircases that go up the tanks? Any of these should be inspected? Some of these industrial areas don't, don't inspect these? Some part of the AC. Right. But, so unless, so it's, they take care of it, if it's broken, then they fix it. Because, it, like you said, it's only for a technician to go up and check something at the top of the tank, right? So, plus how he gets down if something happens up there. So again, we're just going over some stuff. So anybody have a say on, on AC condensers on the top that have these little walkways or, or uh, the, uh, on the billboards? They have this catwalk always. Oh, no billboards, right? How about all exterior steel wooden balconies, bridges? This is bridges. This is in Chelsea Home over here. This is a, a private Bentley College. This is there. This is their crossover. So, is that part of 1001.3? Okay. So, so this this has never been inspected in Chelsea. I know. I have to do the inspections on the back side of all the other cars here, which are all certified by now. Just so you guys know. But that bridge has never been inspected. Right. Wood decks on the back. This is the only means out for some of these people. And these are two and three story. So I'm not talking about single families. So some of these, do I do I inspect these in the back? You know, this is multi units, and this is one of the ways we get out of this one. And it's wood. Inspect it. Two and three family. On the exit. Okay. Let's do this one. This just happened in Boston. News now to a terrifying tumble in Hyde Park. A woman falling more than 30 feet to the ground when that porch you see there collapsed. Now this morning, we're hearing from those who went running when they heard that porch plunge. Seven's Justin Doherty has our story. 
A frightening torch plunge in Hyde Park. Video capturing the moment a woman falls more than 30 feet off a back porch. Third floor stairs collapsing and the second floor railing giving way. She then hit a car before landing on the driveway. Ariel Davis was inside the building when she heard the collapse and ran to help. I was in my bedroom and I heard a loud boom. So I thought it was a car accident and my little sister went to go open the back door and she like was like, oh my God. So I went out and I saw my cousin's friend like on the ground. The fire crews also racing to the scene and quickly noticing the porch is in poor condition. Anyone could tell that uh, the craftsmanship isn't, isn't correct and uh, I don't know the age of it. So obviously dilapidated. Davis in disbelief, thinking it could have been a much different outcome. If the car wasn't there for sure, she would have probably broken her neck or something. So the car saved her and like it could have been could have been my cousin too. And my cousin has kids, so like that's just really scary. The 28-year-old woman has just minor injuries. Crews say she was awake and alert before she was taken to the hospital. This could have been a tragic case. Uh, you know, elderly lady, children. Uh, I'm hoping that this victim is okay. Now, again, that woman is expected to be okay. Again, just minor injuries, and city officials tell me they have condemned the entire back porch, so the whole thing needs to be torn down and rebuilt properly. In Hyde Park, Justin Dory, 7 News Today, New England. So because of that, as you guys, you guys do have some help. First of all, let me finish her story, and then I'll talk about the insurance company that insures some of those and how they're helping you guys. So she, first of all, doesn't live in the building. She was visiting her friend on the top floor. She was going out the back stair because they use the candy day instead of the front stair because you need to pass close to So she basically, this is all caught on a ring camera that everybody has, you know, to answer the door now on the phone. And so she just stepped on that so long. She had stringer tops with nails, just let go. But she fell down. And so when, when she fell down, but she has a protective rail there to help her from falling. So fell down, she was okay. Fell towards the rail, and the rail just let her go. All the nails were all right. I took several photographs of this, of this incident after it happened. So she fell down. She fell another 10 feet. You notice in the, in the video, she bent the, the, the uh, chain link fence pole that went across horizontal. With that, she smashed her head on the car and put a dent on the fender and landed it in between the car and, and, the, and the fence. Well, she survived. So, fast forward to the insurance company. The insurance company that was insuring that said, no, this just happened recently. Why, why wasn't this certified? They've been trying to find a way not to pay you. If you don't have a certificate, which is required by code, what happens? What's the insurance company say? So, uh, Brownstone Insurance, which handles a lot of condos in New York and in Massachusetts and primarily in the Boston area, they said, let's check on this. So, like the Boston Globe ad said, they started going through the uh, every address that they insure and went and looked at it. And they said, such and such address, no certificate on file. Such and such address, no certificate on file. So now you can't renew your insurance. So they're doing it for you guys a little bit. You can't renew your insurance unless you have a current certificate on file. So now some real estate is stuff to step in, and you can't buy or sell property unless you have a certificate on file. Because very often, somebody owns a property for two or three years, and then they have to get a certificate on their file. I said, this is supposed to be part of your closing documentation. So they go back into the pocket of the real estate agent who has insurance, every admission, and the owner who sold the building for $600,000 to say, what, well, you got $30,000 worth of problems here. And you didn't disclose this. So they go backwards in a lot of these sales. Once you guys show up and say, where's my certificate? They say, what are you talking about? I just bought this thing three years ago. So you know, there's several ways. But the insurance part is what's coming in the future. Just so you know, they sometimes don't listen to you guys. I don't know if that ever happens to you guys where the owner, the homeowner, don't listen to you whether you're the city or the state, and they think they have a six months to six year reprieve on anything you guys decide they must do. And, but the insurance company says, it's, they're remarkable, you guys should hire those guys. Now you've got 30 days to give me a certificate or your insurance goes. And so, they don't care about codes, they just say, yeah, we're not insuring your building once you have a certificate, which the code says, and it must do it in five years, so. 
uh, Brownstone Insurance was the first of many to come to help you guys with this program. Okay. Questions or what? Ladders, short ladders. I want, to, I want you guys to tell me, what do you do with these short ladders that are eight to nine feet above? And it's in the code. When they build these, you know what it said? You can build a full system all the way down and at the ninth foot mark, you can have an alternative means to the ground. So it's either going to be a drop ladder, a fold-out ladder, but the continuation to the ground after nine feet can be an alternative. Cantilever. So guess what everybody read in the code 50, 75 years ago? They said, oh, the code says I can build it up to nine feet. They never mentioned the other, you must get to the public way, you must get the great. So little old ladies, can they jump nine feet? Little kids, can they jump my feet? Frail women. <laughs> All right, we got a jerk. Very good. And that's what Jeff did. So, guys, I just need an answer. Somebody give me an answer. When these come, I, I call this a missing component of the fire escape. All you have to do is continue. All you have to do is continue. Everybody went. It's a standard ringtone for every, most people who don't have time to go get another ringtone. <coughs> All right, so with that, Tell me guys, what, what am I going to tell these people who I said, listen, the rest of our street is fine, you got new poles, it's all painted. This is not, this is missing nine feet. Little old lady who lives on that third floor cannot. She barely can get out the window anyway. But if she did, so, and she got a granddaughter with her, she can't jump nine feet without breaking a hip. And what happens to old people who break hips? So should I continue? I'll get to your question in a second. Tell me, am I going to continue this? Is this a missing piece of the a component? It must come to grade, right? With a fold-out ladder, uh, a continuation of the same ladder, just you know, extend it with some angles. You know, an angle here, two by two, an angle here, two by two, and then some cross members that go across. These are easy to, to continue. It doesn't look the same. It's not supposed to look the same. It's supposed to get you to grade. Otherwise, if you have people breaking in, you're going to do a fold-out. Here. Oh, hold on a second. This is grandfather. Off in London for me. I'm telling you, I don't allow it. If it can be certified, I accept it. I accept it. Just the way it is. I accept it. What do I have to accept? I know. I'll never give you permissions to add on to that. Not, again, you're increasing the non-conforming or non-conforming structure. It's missing its component. I've had this question before. If it's, it's a, a missing component, it, was, it wasn't built right 75 years ago. The whole thing was built right. I just, this, uh, this is supposed to have a, a portion of it, a fold out ladder under the or just continue it six, eight, nine feet to the ground. He's saying no. He, you see, so it's not me. I'm, I'm you guys talk to each other. Who is this? You're going to feel my decision. We'll take a ride to Boston. Yeah, let's do it. They'll probably run the standard. I don't sign on these guys. I always put the, the call on the AHJ. Oh, I, I don't oh, say the AHJ will determine whether or not he's going to accept this. If this is conditional, or I make the I make the city official give me a give me a guidance. If this is pre-existing, not conforming, acceptable to the AHJ, I just say I don't sign up on these. But to me, it's either certifiable or it's not. Okay. If it's certifiable. Walk away. Have a nice day. I've done the affidavit for the structure of the unit. I'm not a structure of the unit. I'm not trying to. He states that that's certifiable. That's all the same as the code. But in nowhere in the code does it say you can add on to a ladder. This. I know, it's never going to have that information. But this fire escape, built in 50 years ago, with a permit, it certainly it was acceptable to the building official for 50 years. I just make them aware that there's a missing component, meaning the, the ladder, these, so I can go here, certify this whole thing, check every bolt, make sure everything is super tight, and I just tell the client, listen, you're certified pending the AHJ's decision on extending the ladder or leaving it as is. Because, dude, guys, look, I got an aluminum ladder. They're all nine feet from the ground. These aluminum ladders are usually up there, and you have to jump nine feet off of one of these balconies. So, I understand, in your city, by the way, what's your city? No doubt. No doubt, yeah, same thing. Not all the, a ton of these are no doubt about it. None. So, so, the key right now is that's one guy that will say, well, say, anybody else would allow me to extend the balcony? I mean, extend the ladder. I, so here's somebody saying to extent. So AHJ tells the owners what they will allow and not allow. So you will allow them to jump 19 to the ground. Understand? It's not my decision. I certify from here 
to there. I need help from AHJ over here. Question. Yeah, that, that was built under a previous code cycle that is allowed to remain. Okay? So we have no jurisdiction to go over there and say, you need to extend that component. It was allowed through a previous code. Okay, and that's what we hang yeah. my hat on. Okay? And I'm hanging my hat on saying the code said after ninth, ninth feet from the ground, you must continue the ladder all the way to grade. By we cannot use ladders. Ladders cannot be incorporated. So I'm going to get a building permit. I'm certifying that since the day was installed. The okay. day it was installed, the only thing that they missed, and they 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 sabotaged the code back in 50 years, 50 to 75 years ago, where it said, at this point, what I'm supposed to do is put a balcony here, small balcony, and then I'm supposed to have a fold-up ladder, the ones that, you know, because the people are breaking in. That's how the code, uh, the co so I'm just telling you, 50 to 75 years ago, 98% of the sparks keep it certified when I'm ready to go. I'm having a question, I need help from the HJ. There's this liability here when an old lady and a little kid gets hurt when they hit the ground. I want to be able to say the HJ says grandfathered in, and I don't need you to extend it. Go ahead. I had a fire chief tell me one time that he, his theory behind the whole thing is okay, you got a young mother, she's in that third, four year, she's got two kids. You better decide which kid you like the best because you're only going to get out with one you're not going to save both. Exactly. And so if you want to speak with your fire chief. I mean, I just have difficulty. There's nowhere in the code am I allowed to issue a building permit for an addition to that ladder because, as Glenn said, fire escapes can no longer incorporate ladders. Pre existing condition, fine, certifiable, yes? Yeah. I walk away. The ladder is missing a component. That's all I tell the city official. It's a repair. It's a repair to a component. So, guys, it's I'm not supposed to have to speak with each other. You don't need some. What service? It's a repair. It's a missing component of the system. And as soon as you start, you should repair a deck. You should repair. You should repair a set of stairs. You need a building permit. You don't need a building permit for a repair of a set of stairs. Routine maintenance. No, no. Ordinary. That ladder under the code in 1950 when that was built should not be great. I just finally caught it. Nobody else caught it in all the examinations. I don't make a final decision ever on these things. Missing components or repairs, as you call it, I come back to the A and J and say, you know what? You know what? You know what? Again, it's just what's great the ground. And so, but again, I find I find thousands of these, thousands of these where they don't come to grade. Thousands of those that they don't come to grade. I'm just telling I will speak with every individual inspector and say, you tell me whether this is going to get great grandfather in. I'm telling you, it's 98.5% certifiable. This is good. But in 1950, this thing was supposed to touch grade after nine feet. It's supposed to be cantilevered, drop ladder, fold out ladder, it's a continuation, and it's mainly because people were breaking into the building. So a lot of these people, even if it was that long, they cut these things anyway after 19. I've got a lot of these where you can see the puzzles, the physical cut mark on a ladder that usually comes to great and they cut it. Because people are breaking in. Security. Which a fold out ladder take the question. No, no, yeah, I certify as of the code back 50, 75 years. So let me give you another alternative, another issue. Same fire escape, but all the railings are 24 inches. Do I grandfather that in? Or was it built wrong the day they installed it? That's just a structural question. It's not a code question. So when you certify a fire escape as a, as a design professional, two things. Is it structural sound, must be kept painted, and is there any code violations on the day it was built? So if they built a crappy fire escape that is structurally sound, but the railings don't match 1950, the ladder didn't go all the way to the ground, we come back to the building official who has their constituents to deal with and say, what do you want to do here? I just need some assistance from the HJ. Some say it's okay as is, because I need to I need to not go to court. You guys don't even go to court because you guys have, have some sort of protection. It's a third party inspection. I'm just letting you know that I go back. So I have one city that says, hey, you extend that, 
We're done. We need to staircase to the system. And I have somebody who said, oh, it's a repair. Here's your permit to whatever. Well, by the way, and like you said, nobody pulls permits to fix cars here. Right now, they do here and there. Yes. What code or what law states that that ladder at one time had to go to I don't have the code right my second, but I remember reading it. It says that it can be built. The whole system can be built. It's one of the older code book books that I was and that at nine feet, you have the choice to have an alternative to the ground. And the alternative was a sliding ladder. So a lot of these fire escape ladders have a ladder that sits right on it. And as soon as you release it, she goes, she slides right down against the ground. That's a slider. I've never, I've never told you, I've never seen, I just like to know what the code is. Where it came. Well, you must, all, all egress systems must be degraded. So I had challenged you now. Where in the code does it say that I can stop my egress, my egress stairs, can I stop them nine feet from the ground and jump the rest? That ladder. Where does it, when the code says that I can stop at nine feet? It doesn't say. It doesn't say. So it becomes one of these, you must get to a, you must get to grade and to a public square. But the, the problem, the problem we have right here, the way you're describing, or the problem I have, is that that was done under a previous code. We know. That previous code, Whatever it was before my time, they said nine feet or eight feet or seven feet. So that's where it's at. That's why they were allowed. No. We cannot grant them permission to extend something that doesn't conform. So I'm, 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 I'm just telling you that I read this in You're my right. in my past. Where it is right now, I don't have it in front of me. So the same way, it, this this does not feed end on a public way. This does not eat, does not land in a public way because you must go to grade with all your egress systems. You must go to grade. That's for brand new construction. You're talking two different things. That can it does not say that. All it talks about for existing buildings. First and foremost, you're in the wrong code if you speak to IDC. Okay? If you go into the code for new construction, you're in the IRC with the commercial vendors or the residential vendors. And both talk about the article one. Both those. Uh, look at what's had inspections. That's what you find. Any part of the But new no construction has been. I can't right. agree. Well, well, so for existing construction, construction though, there's only three things you can do. Like, I'm telling you, I didn't know that right now, but I've been taking that form that we dealt with in years. Specifically, when it first came out in 2005, it came out with the side of it, sending it to egress, okay? Fire escapes, all that stuff. And Joe was the one who. We actually stopped for arresting appeals. First of all, we would say, appeal our decision, please. We're going to call them. How many times did we lose up here? We lost every single time because the board would say, no problem. We go on. But they couldn't back up the code anyway because it's not a point here. And that's the problem. I have used to certify that as a acceptable second year second year sentence. I've gone to certify that as a fire suit. That's not a second year second year sentence. That's a great thing for you not to call me fire suit. If I get a certification from a structural engineer, design professional, or anyone suitable in the ADHJ, that's for me, or very close to the code, I would accept it. But somebody comes and says, I just had two right now where they came, they took a ladder, a piece of shit model like that, and worn a the wire above the building, and they moved it to the outside with a big seal. And I go out to do the certification, I'm like, what's going on? Oh, we did this. Right. You can't do it, folks. You gotta, you gotta make sure you, you don't get certified. There's a big difference between a second gate of egress and a fire escape. And people have a difficult time with that distinction. It's right in, it's right in code, right in article one, in both residential events and commercial events. And there's a, there's a, a big distinction between the two. <laughs> one more thing to say, I guess, and that is, I'm not trying to figure out a business. No, no, no. I'm saying that they're saying that's my second ease. No. No, this is a fire escape. That's a fire escape. That's not a second ease. Okay, so that's your unit that serves it with the window and the ladder. That's the problem. That's certifiable. That's perfectly fine. They pay the system on the wall. I mean, I guess we're talking standards. Yeah, I, I would accept 
So President Trump is here. here. Looking at some of those pictures, and, and I would say, and there's no question about it, they shouldn't have fire screens. They should be enclosed to stay on That's what should be on most of these pictures. Right. Instead of this I, that one picture you had coming down, what do you say, 20 stories or something? That, that's ridiculous. That should be an enclosed stair level. So the fire escapes, all these buildings were supposed to have been knocked out and replaced by today, but somebody invented duct, duct tape, bubble gum, paper clips. And so these structures that are not supposed to be 75 to 125 years old. Every 75% of them are chocolate vanilla answers in question. 25% of the time I will see this happening where an architect, an engineer, uh, or others acceptable to you to serve my fire escape will come in with a question. And a lot of times, every city official has said, what's the best solution here to at least get it safer? Whether it be extending the ladder, whether it be the last piece a stair, or whatever, a window into a door, whatever it may be, it's, that happens 25% of the time. I don't make that call. I always ask an assistant to the AHJ question. Uh, we have a, a retired building inspector, Billy Horrocks, in, in, the, in the room here. Can we ask him what he would do? <laughs> Are you sure you want it? Are you sure you want that? That sounds like boring. Yes, yeah, it, 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 oh, he's the artist. All right. You, you, you talk about fire escapes from 1958 or whatever that you saw that it had to be whatever. Okay? That could be true, but that was under city ordinance or a town bylaw. There was no building code prior to 1975 in Massachusetts. So no one in this room can enforce any of that requirement whatsoever. Other than chapter 92 under 148 says, you must maintain in accordance with the code it was constructed in. So that's it. So you can't enforce a lot of this stuff because you can't write it and cite it because you don't have the capability. In 1982, it used to say on fire escapes that ladders have to be a minimum of six foot eight off the ground. Minimum, and in the building code. That's where that height came from. It was in the third edition. That you could not have it any less than six foot eight because that was your headroom. The, the reason for ladders is they don't have the land they did, it was meant for the city of Boston or somewhere else like that to do it to um, not replace but before the collapsible stairs. Alleyways. You've got to understand you can't use the building code, the IBC, for fire escapes. You can't go there. Actually, if you go there, you won't find fire escapes, will you? It's in Chapter 34. Chapter 34 has Chapter 1, Massachusetts amended Chapter 34, Chapter 1 and 34 to amend it about the five-year certification. Are we on the right track? So you can't enforce anything new on a on IBC in an existing building. You cannot enforce IBC in Chapter 10. You are aware of that. You cannot look at Chapter 10 in an existing building. What you are allowed is chapter one, there are three items. And the only thing that it mentions about means of egress is two items. Do I have two? If I need to, and are they wide enough? Are you all agree with me? Exactly. If you go in and say the stairs are wrong, the headroom's wrong, or anything else is like, out looks like that, you're in trouble. <coughs> because that is not a winnable case that appeals. You can't cite it. So with this discussion, as long as you get that five-year certification, it is the due diligence of the professional engineer to look at this and say, okay, it's being maintained in accordance with my research. And the only qualified people you should be allowing a letter, if you accept a letter for qualified people, it should only be anybody that's in the building code, i.e., built uh, certified in, uh, engineers, re uh, re registered design professional. They're in the building code, you agree? Yes. Now once you leave there, you go to 110R1. You're allowed to accept something from a testing lab because they're in the book. I wouldn't, but you can. Then you can accept the, te the technician because they're in the book. It's there, you can. That's R2, R3. Modular homes, you accept the label, correct? Because yes. it's in the book. R4, timber, 
They cut the tree down in the yard and built a house. You can accept it because Massachusetts certified that sawmill. So, uh, five, you can accept it from a uh, licensed builder. If you choose to, I wouldn't, but if you choose to, that's your choice. And then R6 going R7, another building inspector. Certified building inspector can come in if you choose to accept that. But as far as anybody else giving you a lot of the fire escape is safe, and you put it in that document, I wouldn't do it. Because it's there. So with this, all of this, that headroom was there, it was six foot eight, but there's nothing prior to 1975. And chapter 10 does not apply to that building. Thank you. Great job. See this guys? Every ladder question that I ask is not the same. Every ladder question is eight or nine feet because people can't put their hands on it. So I will never, I have never seen these, but this is an example. See that's one right there. Yep. That is that is this balcony. That is this ladder. That is, uh, as you can see, it's a little bit more than six eight. So the question now still becomes: Do we extend until we hit the minimum of six eight? Because I was, I'm going to have to go back and do my research to find out where I read the word nine feet, because that's what I find a lot of them are nine feet. So that ladder, that balcony, and the brackets on that one is. One and a half inch by three sixteenths on average, if not eight on the brackets. Metal ones are a minimum of two by two by quarter thick to hold up firing the people. So, we moving forward. Somebody mentioned the Home Depot ladder. Is this a lot? This is a slider. This accordion ladder is out of California. You know why we don't have them here? In case they freeze and that when the rain storm and it freezes, it's different. These accordion ladders. So if they get water and they freeze, these things are blocks of ice. So that's why they're not here. But the predominant is the California accordion ladder that drops by itself. But Home Depot ladders, full window, a lot or not a lot? A word a lot, right? So here's the thing you have to have a balcony outside. Your window, so you can prepare yourself to use a ladder. These showed up on a Saturday or a Sunday. These ladders, okay, guys. So it's uh, to my question always to the city official is: if you look on your files, there's no permit for this ladder. It was not built in code 15, 75 years ago, and the homeowner installed this ladder. So in some cases, this triggers: I need a new egress stair, fire escape which is usually 24, because that's the only place you're, you're emptying is at that attic. It's going to be a balcony, an egress stair, 24 inches, 8 8 rise, come out all the way to grade, right? To a public way then. Or some city officials have allowed the balcony to be put outside that window. So the person can get out the window, stand up, get themselves ready, and then they go down the ladder. Comments? Yes, no, some of you are yes, some of you are no. Again, it says it's not 24, that's 22 inches. That's a, that's a fire escape. Right. That's uh, it. If you're not covered by lot lines, that picture on the right, full second heat egress. So platform door or platform. So you want 36 inches what? It's not what I want, so the code is 7 You can't install them. In fact, you install them fire escape, aren't you? Uh, not unless you're covered by lot lines. Fire escapes are not subject to lot lines. But the only way you can install a fire escape legally is if you're covered by lot lines. Because the fire escape dimension requirements are much different than full second easy. Right. So, so you, have have just, you have to have additional lot lines. Otherwise, you I get these all the time. I'm, my question to any city official, including yourself, are you going to let them put the balcony? Pre existing is not conforming. How do you want to treat this? Pre existing, I need a balcony up there and then a ladder, not the, not the aluminum ladder. I'm saying a uh, metal ladder coming all the way to grade. No, ladder cannot be incorporated. The one on the right, I recently had one of those the homeowner installed. She had two one year old children. I asked her which kid don't you want. Right, right. So so question I should have that. We exist on the number one. I don't know when it got installed. 
No, no, I don't think it's it's I I I can make my decision on that. I can verify that the lab is so structural, right? But then it's just a whole thing about the things that we need to get in pair here. Because what I tell people that have this is show me how it works. I have a landlord show me how it works. And you know how hard it is to basically get your butt out this window and then find that rung and go down that, that ladder? Like you said, you're not like what you're leaving behind because they're not going to get out. And you only got three to five minutes before the smoke kills you and then the house burns on you. So, so I'm asking you guys. We are here to, it must be structurally sound, must be kept painted. Every bolt, every connection gets looked at. The runs get looked at. But this is a code question. I don't answer code questions. I go back to the city officials who have a hard line in one, in one city, but in some other, he said, you know what, I know Joe, I know, you know what I'm saying? So that's my question. These come up from structural engineers. Uh, and uh, anybody that's looking at the structurally sound, I think I painted. That's what with it. Code is, was it, to a certain degree, was it code compliant on the day of its installation? If it not, which is that when it was not, I go back to the AHJC. Help me here, what do you want to do with Joe? And you guys decide what happens with Joe. I just need to document it that you guys like Joe better than Brown. Okay? Guys, this is still in existence. Elizabeth, New Jersey. Ten stories. Ready? Yeah. Ready? You've never seen one of these. Ready? Not, I don't know of anyone who has seen that. Ready? Built in the, in, this is a 1900 uh, building. Let's see what those guys are pushing open. Wow, look at that. What is that? It's a slide scape. Ten stories. And by the way, you don't get a potato sack. You jump on and go. And sometimes in the middle of the corkscrew, you fall forward, so now you're going down head first into this. And if there's a jam or a block of any kind, where too many people block up the sausage and the, the building's on fire, guess what? It's a human sausage roll all the way down. Then at the very bottom, and I went through this, through this uh, exercise here, there's an iron door with a huge paddle that you're supposed to come down either with your head first or your feet, and you're supposed to hit it with your feet, and this huge iron door just swings open, and then you go down a straight slide, 45 degrees, to uh, the other door to the public. I didn't certify it, but this building built in 1905 had what we call the slide skates. Slide used to be an answer. It was in the code. It's no longer in the code. But you had slide skates that were part of the key resolution in the 1900s. Okay? A lot of military would have these on military locations to get the guys out of the second floor. Not very old. Imagine this, like, you know, being in college. Being in school, and every now and then you would uh, you would get the slide to, to recess. That ten-story building, when they used to heat it up with coal, and the kids as a, a rite of passage in high school, they always used to sneak in, go to the top floor, right? And uh, these were all Catholic high school kids, and they would you know rite of passage is you snuck in, you went to the tent, you jumped in, you went all the way down. So the, finally, the guy who's just was sick of these kids, and so what he do, he used to get coal dust, because the thing was, was heated up by coal back in the day. So he would put coal dust, knowing the season that when these kids are supposed to break in, go up to the top, just like that, and you know, they'll all be wearing you know, white clothes. And so he knew what kids were in this building, because everybody came up full of that soot. And that soot that got on your clothes, got on your skin. So he, he would always know when kids were breaking in and doing that. That's that tall building. All right. Oh, where's this? This, is, this must have been a fireman that did this one. <laughs> Guess what college this is? Rutgers University. The first and only ever. <laughs> and I think this is a dormitory. I'm like, uh, you guys still want to keep this where you want to put it? Pre-existing, non-conforming, slight whole fire escape. Built in the 1900s. And everything kept evolving. Just because things were built once doesn't mean they, they took on things. But this is the fire unit. So unless you're training, training kids that are the fire unit, this is the slide full fire unit. The only one in existence. And Rutgers, it's still up. Rutgers did not change it. Okay, this is another thing that we need to talk about. These are called, these are aluminum and or throwback. These are not second to speakers, guys. And I've got the certain situations where in the bag, in the corner, there's one of these. 
and somebody said, that's my second piece of egress. This is not, this is a supplemental piece of egress. You can have this in every room you want in your house, but you need a real fire escape to get out of a building. But some people think this, and so whether you're climbing out and fixing yourself or whatever, these are very difficult to go down. But it's almost like having a fire extinguisher. It's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. So supplemental. Never, never, uh, never grandfathered in as your the second unit egress because you bought the house this way. Never. Spirals. Inspect them all. Cantilevers. In your city, if you have a cantilever and it has a chain on the back of weight to back to the to the structure in any way, it's out of balance. So what you're supposed to do on a cantilever is supposed to be perfectly balanced. It's called a balanced cantilever with a release arm on it. Some of them that don't have the release arm on it, you step out one, two, and guess what happens? It comes down by itself, two to three feet per second. If you have a release arm on it, what happens is it's usually three to five steps before the pivot points. As soon as you release it, she starts dropping by herself because she weighs 25 pounds on the nose. And she comes down slowly, two to three feet per second, hits the ground and stays down. So you, as a parent, can go down, get yourself self-evacuated, get out and go to a public way, far away. The firemen arrive and what's down on the ground for them? This perfectly balanced cantilever fire escape. And what happens is now they come, they run up and do whatever. Are you guys aware that if you speak with your fire chief, fire marshal actually, or fire chief actually, they're all told in classes, every single fireman is told in classes today, in case of fire, do not use the fire escape. Are you aware of that? Every single fire person being trained, and they have towers at that fire escape, and they're trained on it a little bit, that they say, use your own ladders, 10, 20, 30 feet of your own ladder. And use your fire trucks that come in with a nice lift if your city can afford one. And does that does that take usually longer than three to five minutes for the smoke move that kills it? So every fireman is taught today, because we haven't been watching fire escapes for over 75 years, in case of fire, do not use the fire escape to save anyone, because we don't trust fire escapes. So what's going to stop these firemen? <coughs> that, and we're going to talk about this shortly, is a tag, a white tag. Some cities do this already. They tag their fire escape. How do you know a fire escape is not certified on a building? It doesn't have a tag. Elevators have tags. Fire extinguishers have tags. If every fire escape, if a fire escape is a, is a means, is a fire protection equipment, does all fire protection equipment need a tag as per fire code? Then fire escapes in the West Coast Fire escapes fall under fire protection, and all of them are supposed to have a tag. So imagine you walking down, you know, uh, the rentals in the building walking down, the fire official walking down any street, looks up, has 10 fire escapes, sees nine of these tags, and sees one without a tag, he doesn't care whether it's certified or it needs minor repair. He just knows that he needs to write a violation on that one. As long as he knows the address, he does not need to get near it. Because it's a third party inspection that determines it's certified. Not you guys from the ground saying, this doesn't look so good, let me write a violation. If there's a five year rule in mass and it has a tag, guess what? It makes it easy for everybody concerned as to whether or not it's an easy do. Oh, look, that one building down this alleyway it doesn't have a tag, let me write one. Requesting what? Because you saw something bad? No, because the law says what? You need to have a tag on it. Tags. If it's under repair, yellow. If it's a, if it's a problem building, problem landlord, it gets a red. If it has a life safety, it gets a red. If it has even a danger, it gets a red. Now, the building inspector and the fire marshal together determine whether there's going to be an evacuation of the building, determine whether or not there's going to be a fire watch. Do we get involved? Oh. Guys together. He can lie to you guys because most owners lie to us. We try not to lie to you guys because we say we find bullets of repairs and problems. And sometimes the owners tell us, if you find any bullets, 
give them to me, I'll give it to the building inspector. Guess what happens? So we decided to now say, uh, before we even inspect the project, we'll call your city and town and say, hey, uh, you violated this, right? You want us to tell you what we tell this building inspector? Yep. You want us to give you any bullets we find that are violations, life safety, or imminent dangers? Yes. So the day you know is the day I want to know because in the meantime, while we get this fixed in six days, six weeks, six months, six years in some of your landlord cases, what do you guys need to know? You guys need to look, speak to this guy and say, hey, we, I got bullets and you guys can put it in your gun, your code gun, and go, we're not allowed to shoot guns. We're not enforcing what you guys enforce. So we'll get it back to you. But if you say, so, you guys understand why this is out of balance? You know how you know how I would fix this? Because you've got three thousand dollars worth of work here. That's an example. You know how I fix that? And you guys don't even know the better. I grab a chain from Home Depot for twenty-five bucks. I grab this tail right here, and I come up and I grab the railing right there. Is that structural? Nope. Is it horizontal? Yeah. I just want you to make it horizontal. So I'll fix this for two hundred and fifty bucks. And when you come by and you see chains on the tails of any of these handle levers. Because as they get rusty and the quarter inch of plates that are there become one inch of rust, does it get heavier? And what's it do? As it starts going up, that means that a child, a person, now has to come down these stairs, walk up as many of these, control the balance, figure this out. And a lot of times it's a 150 pound woman dragging a 25 to 50 pound child. And as soon as that woman steps off this unbalanced cantilever that's already in this direction, right? She steps off. What happens to the child? Only weighs 25 pounds. It's catapult. Or the child is smart enough to hold on. This child now is 12 feet in the air. And what is mommy doing? What does she say to the kid? Jump. And until a fireman gets there with his pipe hole and does what? Hooks it, pulls it down slowly so the child doesn't get even further scared. And then he puts his foot on it. Child gets away. Now what happens for that fireman that just put his foot on this cantilever that wants to throw itself back up? And there's more firemen arriving. So they've just lost one fireman and what's he doing? He's a doorman now, he's a fire escape man. His job is to sit there standing on this fire escape while other firemen go up and down. So the fire department loses one guy. So cantilevers are supposed to drop two to three feet per second by themselves, hit the ground, stay down. That's why they call them balanced fire safety. Questions? Startling scene in downtown Colorado Springs Wednesday after a man falls to his death. I was just walking up the street to get to the bus stop and the cops were right there told me I couldn't come this way. Police say the victim and several others were working on the roof of this privately owned building when the man fell. He may have fallen um, a distance of anywhere from 15 to 20 feet is what's being investigated right now. Tragically, the man died on scene. It's believed he fell from the fire escape and not the roof or a window, although how it happened is still unknown. That's what's being investigated right now to determine the actual cause of the accident itself. Right now, police say the death is not criminal and is being called an industrial accident. There were several witnesses, individuals who were working with the, uh, the deceased party, um, and so we've interviewed them as witnesses in this investigation. It's really sad. I feel bad for his family. I mean, I don't know him, but prayers and best wishes to his family for sure. Others in the area expressing similar concerns and well wishes, visibly distraught by the day's events. I mean, I can't even imagine it just coming out to do your job one day and just fall off a building. Like, it's really sad. He fell in the ground. His other two friends were far enough back that they held on, but it was a, it was a drop. It killed him. All right. So that was in Utah. Acknowledging that lax enforcement by the city could have contributed to the Back Bay fire that claimed the lives of two firefighters. Welders working next door may have been working on the building's fire escape when they sparked the deadly fire. Fox Undercover revealed Wednesday that fire escape hadn't been inspected in 10 years, even though inspections are required every five years. Investigative reporter Mike Baudet digging up some new exclusive information tonight. Mike? We looked at the entire Beacon Street block where the fatal fire happened and discovered, just like 296 Beacon Street, most of the fire escapes there are overdue for inspections. It turns out 
The city doesn't have any mechanism in place to track building owners violating the rules and hold them accountable. Mayor Walsh is not happy. Are you concerned that inspection wasn't done since 2004? Of course I am. And it's something that, you know, constantly every day it seems like something new is coming up around inspectional services. And we are looking at revamping a lot of a lot of the procedures in there. Boston Mayor Marty Walsh talking about 296 Beacon Street, the place where welders may have been working on the fire escape when they sparked the inferno at 298 Beacon Street, a fire that killed Boston Fire Lieutenant Ed Walsh and firefighter Michael Kennedy. Records reveal that fire escape had not been inspected since 2004, even though state building code requires inspections every five years. So the fire escape should have been inspected in 2009 and then again this year, which raises a troubling question according to fire code expert Amy Cronin, president of Strategic Code Solutions. We have to question if it were if it had been done in 2009, perhaps there may have been some damage there. Uh, like if you think about rust, if you catch it early enough before there's massive damage and there needs to be reconstruction, maybe the welding would have never been done. Two of our heroes lost their life in that fire, uh, and I'm not sure if that was the cause, but regardless whether that was the cause or not, we still should have inspected that property. It turns out many inspections are not being done. Fox Undercover looked at fire escape inspection records for the entire Beacon Street block where the deadly fire happened. Two-thirds of those fire escapes are overdue to be inspected. A third of the fire escapes on the block haven't been inspected in 10 or more years. It's the responsibility of property owners to get the inspections done. But there's no evidence of the city cracking down on owners breaking the rules. Shouldn't the city know if an inspection hasn't been done in all those years? Absolutely, it should. And, and there, should be, there should be a report generated that's able to find out what, what properties haven't been inspected. So if that's one of the properties that haven't been inspected on, on Beacon Street, can you just imagine the other pro properties in the city of Boston? That concerns me. Back to 296 Beacon Street, where the welders who sparked the fire were working. We told you the last inspection on the fire escape was done in 2004. As we reported Wednesday, that inspection was done by Giuseppe Falcone, who owned D&J Ironworks in Malden. Falcone is being sued by the owner of the building that burned down, but he denies having anything to do with the welding that day. No comment from the owner of 296 Beacon Street, which did not have the fire escape inspected for a decade. I'm Mike Baudet for Fox Undercover. So, sorry about that. Did everybody hear that? So, uh, welding witch doctors killed some of our clients. Uh, I taught a class right after that. 2014, I believe, was the year that that happened. Okay. About eight years ago. Probably about six years ago. And, uh, you know, everybody says, oh, the welding rods kill these fires. Uh, if the welding rods kill the firemen, and that means that you're not supposed to be welding fire safety yet. In every one of your cities, welding rods is by far the cheapest way out to get just enough repair to make it pass. But there's no, they don't pull any fire watches. Bolting is the repair of these things because they were built with bolts and rivets. And welding has never been the repair. It's been the patch. Okay? And so it'll burn down buildings. They were welding the left fire escape. They caught the shed on fire from the left side welding. And so this fire took off on the day that had 60 mile an hour winds. And these firemen were on the ground floor. But when they broke windows front and rear, the 60 mile an hour winds just took that flame. And to my knowledge, they weren't burnt, they, they died of inhalation. So, please, don't let anybody weld the car escape. Several problems that have happened there. So, are you saying that there's no portion of the fire escape that is all like because water was in our kits and stuff like that? Well, yeah. So, um, then you really can't do There is a few things. So, yeah, show your tread. So, here's a replacement tread on here. This one's here. So, yeah, those are welded at the shop. They need to weld it at the site. They can take this tread out held by cobalt. Ready? Welded tread, bolted in. They can take this piece down to wherever they want, and they have that. They have some areas down on the ground. Sometimes they have a welding trailer, and they just weld it there. Then they bring it back in and put in more bolt. And yes, all the pickets, which are made at your shop, they get welded. 
at the shop, but then they get bolted in in the location. There's four bolts on every rail. You can have all the So yes, some treads. Yeah. This is made out of shock. This is a replacement tread. Yes, welded here at the shop. Installed with four bolts though. My structural, when I structurally look at the tread, I look at these bolts. This is all welded. By the way, the replacement grading has no spacers. You guys know that the 75 to 125 year old spacers that kick the thing every one inch, like this aluminum one here, they're all rotted inside. I can't fix them. So what's the, what's the cure? Replace the tread with one of these. Or on any grating or any tread that has the spacers, it's like just put a one inch piece of flat. No welding involved. McNichols clips, these things hold grating down, you know, and they're spaced so that we can do it for the old style. So, you know, I would have a piece of grating. I mean, a piece of flat underneath here goes from front to back. And I put a McNichols clip on the back, which it holds two, two, of the, two of the flats. McNichols clip on the front, and two or three, whatever's needed in the middle, and I've just negated this, this tread. The client can keep his tread, because the flats are in good order. The space are holding it. But again, the bolts on the side, there's no rust in any of the clips. And so, whether you're looking at this little even grade, grade that has spacers, so every run is about two feet apart, just Keep your grading. Just quarter inch, solid one inch top. They're fine, just put a, a reinforcement of, the, uh, of that and 24 inches later make another one. So it's just a one inch core piece of flat with McNichols clips screwed and bolted down. No welding allowed or involved in that repair. And if there's some repair that has to have a weld, they're going to need a fire watch. So, you know, 1% of the time it can only be welded as a repair. Otherwise, everything can be turned into a mechanical connection. You know what I'm saying? So, guys, with a, can a fire watch go there in a very unique situation? Yeah, of course you can. But everything, a lot of times, we inspect bolts. We don't inspect welds. There's a special welding. If you're welding on site, it's a special welding, uh, special welding inspection. For any welding on site, we don't do it. So that's why pretty much all repairs on fire escapes have ceased the welding side. But there's still a few guys out there sneaking in, we call them the welding. Which doctors, but they have a body count of how many so far? Two. Two. About fire escapes in New York City, they are crucial, of course, to survival in so many buildings here. After the recent fire escape collapse that killed a man in Soho two weeks ago, our investigative reporter Jim Hoffer went out to take a closer look at fire escapes, found that many are rusting, warped, or have missing pieces. Not a good scenario mm -hmm. if you use one of them. Jim's here now with his exclusive report. Jim? We learned that in the wake of that fatal accident, three additional fire escape steps were found to be loose, even though the seven-story structure was deemed safe in its last inspection. At least it had been inspected, even if not thoroughly. Thousands upon thousands of fire escapes, six stories or less, are rarely ever inspected. When a step fell seven stories from a fire escape on this Howard Street building, it fatally fractured the skull of a man walking by. It also exposed the city's weak oversight of these steel structures hanging over the heads of New Yorkers everywhere. You see a bolt missing. Should that have passed? There's a bolt missing on that connection. This is the actual fire escape. Inspector and founder of the National Fire Escape Association, Cisco Manessas, says the Howard Street fire escape should have never passed inspection in its last check in 2013 when a private engineer found the structure safe with maintenance repairs required, in this case, painting, which the safety expert says masked the corrosion. It's all scraping paint, so there's very few structural work really done on proper inspections being done on these New York fire escapes. These fire escape inspections are only required of a building owner every five years as part of the city's mandatory facade inspection law, which applies to buildings six stories or higher. Our investigation has found that below six stories, no fire escape inspections are required, even though there are tens of thousands of them, and many, as we've discovered, more than 100 years old and in really bad shape. 
You're they're... saying they're ready to fall. Right. If you step on them, they're going to ready to fall. We went with the head of the National Fire Escape Association to one block in Hell's Kitchen. So these kinds of fire escapes, thousands of them across the city of New York, are just simply not on the radar. Right of inspectors and there and this is the norm i believe if we were to walk down this far this street right now 75 percent of these would fail let's do it one after the other these fire escapes according to our expert failed five out of the five we checked it's supposed to be connected to that to that bolt there if it broke off it's holding an entire staircase that staircase you overloaded it's going to collapse missing bolts and rust corrosion weakening every fire escape that we looked at when you get to three quarters to one inch of rust pack dangerous in internally on a tread that's another person who's going to fall through we wanted to see if the city knew how widespread the problem is so we checked the 311 database and found in just the last 12 months new yorkers called to complain about fire escape problems nearly 1,700 times. That's a lot. A red flag? Definitely. Anything, again, on the exterior of the building that could fall off could kill someone. The building's department says it has no plans to do random inspections. A spokesman tells us owners of buildings six stories or less are responsible for safely maintaining their buildings. We should note here, too, that outside of the city, state law requires that all fire escapes, no matter the height of the building, get inspected every five years. So, if you're in New York, you know, anybody you know is living there, all buildings under six stories, so I guess how many six-story buildings they're, they're, they built that need no facade inspection. If you have a seven-story, you have a five-year facade inspection and all that, you have a six-story, so I guess how many six-stories <coughs> exist and they never have to inspect for us. You want to throw you another one? You ever been to L.A.? L.A. only inspects the ladders. Only. On every structure in L.A., sorry about that, so every structure in LA, once a year, they must verify that the ladders in, is fully functional. The cantilever is fully functional. What about the rest of the fire escape? Yeah, we're, we don't care. Not that they don't care, it's not required. But now as of January 1, every fire escape has this enforced now five year. Now have I ever represented a city, I have represented the city of LA. It was sued for $15 million because somebody got electrocuted on one of the fire escapes. It had nothing to do with the structural adequacy, but somebody got electrocuted because within two feet was 4,000 volt power lines. So it was the city plus the electrical giant there that is half owned by the city or whatever. And so this guy got electrocuted on the fire escape. They still had to settle with him for $30 million, but he's not there. So for what? You know what I'm saying? But um, so can cities get sued? The answer is yes. Um, but they settled with $30 million. I was the expert witness on that case helping the city with the situation. So can this happen? Um, weird things can happen if we don't catch it. So let's see what else we have there. Oh, ready? Why do we do a lateral load test? 200 pounds. Question? Sir? Yeah, is there a question? Yeah, yeah, in the second row. Yeah, okay. So does he have a question? Nobody has a question. Okay. Warren, do you have a question? No. Okay. So guys, this is graphic. Okay? The reason why railings have to have a 200 pound lateral load test is in case you're smoking a butt, drinking a drink, and you're leaning on any rail, it needs 200 pounds of force exerted on it, and that's part of a load test. So 100 pounds per square foot, 200 pound lateral load test on all the pieces of the railing. So, just in case, in case you missed it. <laughs> Guys, lateral load test. This thing is supposed to be, there's supposed to be a frame here so that I can tie my posts to a frame. This post is attached to two, two one-eight pieces of flat. And this thing ties back to the house. 
Anybody can see on the front row. Is that an eighth or three sixteenths? Front row. Yeah, it's an eighth. These need three eighths to tie back to the building. So this could be that. All right, let's move it along to what's the next step? Tax. Everybody agree with tax? How it comes into play? Maybe the state will get involved. <laughs> Guys, all fire protection equipment must be tagged. Let's get a white tag on these things. And, and who controls the tax? You guys control the tax. You guys have a relationship with some printing shop in the area, and that's the approved tag. And so I'll show you some tags. And uh, again, we've done a lot of these classes everywhere. In, in um, Seattle, one of my first states that I helped write the confidence test, there was no confidence test. There was no 25 point question. I created it, and a lot of the states have copied it and used it. And again, Lowell is the number one IBC code in the nation. Other states that are IBC based use Lowell, for example. If you're IFC based, then it's the Yonkers. They're number one. Okay? So this is 19 inches long, 11 inches high. There's a, uh, a print shop that, that they authorized to make these uniform. And it has, you know, what company inspected it, the date it was inspected, the next date of when it's gonna, the next due date. So 2007, 2012, the name of the company, and a phone number. All these light things. So how do you know if our state becomes certified in your city? It doesn't have a, a tag. That's all. It's gonna have an updated tag. And if it's white, most likely, but it's that thing. All right, so this is what their tags look like when you walk down their alleyways. <laughs> Will help? Will that help firemen and building inspectors? Always deal with the second means of egress? So what's this mean? Does the state have to do something? Can you create a local ordinance, or do you just, I don't know, state, cities, what do you have to do to say, I want all my fire escapes tagged? So what's this first step? The first step, you got to put out a general letter that says all fire escapes must have a tag. Please have your fire escape tags. And if you have um, already certified your fire escape recently, just have your city, I mean, have your engineer call us. We'll tell them what print shop we use that makes standard tags that have your name on it, the, the current date, the new new date, some license numbers, some names, whatever code is. One of the last codes, it was 102826. Remember that one? Guys, on central tagging is a good way to get this ball off the, off the ground. What about permits? Permits at the beginning of the process or permits at the end of the process? Will either one help you? You gotta start chewing away at this. Anything else? How about the health department? Shut down the building and everybody goes back in. Should a, uh, a verification of a second means of egress be one of those requirements? You know how many excuses? Buying and selling a piece of property. What's the first thing you have to have? Here's right, they say when they go to the fire department for one thing or they go to the York department. What's the first thing you say? Is there two means of egress? Buying or selling this property? So make sure at the closing you have a, so any other ideas? So you're gonna get extinguishers charged with fire escapes. Oh, sprinkler systems. You think that sprinkler systems should be tied in with fire escapes? Because when the, when the fire starts, the sprinklers put out fire. But in the meantime, while sprinklers are going off, a lot of times some of these buildings have fire escapes. So every time you get a sprinkler test, should you have, should these two guys be married? Sprinkler testing and fire escape certification should be married. One triggers the other. So if I have a fire escape to inspect, I call the sprinkler guy because I saw sprinklers in the building. Hey, just so you know I'm doing this, you want to coordinate and because the city officials are going to want you know, coordination on it. Do you guys think that's a great idea? So there's, what ideas do we have? Any more ideas? Of a stop that forces owners to get their fire escape certified? The insurance is coming, but not for a while. Sadly, not all national insurance companies are going to step in and do this. Got it? Who inspects fire escapes? The authority have in the jurisdiction, so it's design professionals or others acceptable for the building efficient. So you guys may or may not like an architect to do this. You may or may not like a specialty company to do this. But for sure, a engineer, you know, and it doesn't have to be structural engineer. It's an engineer with a PE, right? So you got some PE guys that have no experience in this stuff, but the money is what? The money is good. Well, we even have civil engineers that will attempt it, right? That's up to because they don't specify structural, and a lot of people don't know. Everybody gets a PE stamp in every state. Certain stamps, certain states, 
they make you go for additional training on structural. So that you can call yourself a structural engineer, otherwise everybody gets a PE. Yeah, okay. So be careful. So PEs, architects, and others acceptable to the building official. And you can have any other be washed or peer reviewed by a structural engineer. Okay? So engineers, architects, city officials. You know, I have so many people tell me, but the building official said there's one loose trail. I said, no, there's more than just one. No, no. The building official said, one loose tread. And as soon as I fix that one loose tread, I'm good. And then we have to tell them, no. And then they, what do they do? They hand the phone. Why? Because they're looking for a rubber stamp. Plenty of them out there. How much they charge? Two to three hundred. There's a guy that's very expensive and he knows who they are. A thousand dollars. It's called a blind drive-through. So he, this engineer just drives up to the property on the front, even though the car skips in the back. He rolls down his window. He has a pre-filled, signed out. You know this guy, right? And then, yeah. And then he, he then takes this envelope and he gives him another sort of envelope swap, paper for paper. Right? You want to? You have a story on this thousand bucks? I it back yesterday. Oh. Or sadly, 
it actually looked like that. The point. So what's it mean? It needs a heavy individual to step on it the right way. It needs a fireman loaded with a backpack and whatever he needs to go up there to hit it the right way going up or going down on the right side or the left side. Or it needs a three pound baby sludge. Right? And all we do is just go ping, 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 pong, pong, right? And these things are dangerous even for us to inspect. That tread that killed that guy on the ground from an eight story, a woman inspector, architect, was inspecting for the firm. She stepped on that tread and gave way on one side, fell through because it just pulled away from the other side. That they, the same firm said five years before it just needed a paint job. Does that? So she almost got killed. That thing came down, ping, 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 and you kill somebody down below. Okay? So these are the kind of things we're now dealing with on structures in your area that are 75 to 125 years old, and only a few of them greater than that. Okay? So let's let's look at this, ready? Right? The ping pong test. Okay, Russ? Russ, you think that's gonna fail or hold an inspection? Uh, or, uh, or comes down to at least six, eight, you know, what we just got informed. 
So everybody's going to, so any, any design professional asking you for assistance is just that. They can tell if something is structural or not. This just proves that they did There's 25 questions. So who did that? 25 questions. All the codes are here to help everybody. But, so certain cities came out. Lowell is one of them. You have one in your, in your, in your book. Pull it out. You know, the Lowell one, please. This is also a vendor sheet. This vendor sheet is for them to give the client three references, licenses, and insurance. Okay? So who did that? City of Lowell. This is an older city of Lowell. You have the latest, greatest one, and it includes loan testing in their questions. It's all yes, no questions. This makes the, the design professional put his license on the line, because if he's going to rubber stamp stuff, guess what? You have a false document in your hands. So always keep the first thing he sent, because it comes on their letterhead. And just send them a copy of the Lowell one with your city information on the top. Okay? And then what happens? It's legal now, guys. Yeah, this is something that should be approved at the state level, though. This shouldn't be something that we have to get into what somebody should sign. Because what's going to happen is the city of the decides they're going to use this, we're going to send it out to all the homeowners. All the landlords are going to get together, they're going to go after the building official because they're saying, okay, you're asking for something that's over and above, which, I mean, I'm behind it 100%, but getting it approved at the state level, so that way it's not the individual that he's looking to go over and above and then the whole room is going after him. In the, in the meantime, Lowell's already doing this, and so is Malden. So the uh, building commissioner, of, uh, who's also the president of the MCIA, came from Lowell, and the first thing he implemented in Malden was this. But yes, should the state have a, a, a conference? These are all general questions, guys, about every component. Is this railing component have any rust in there? Does it have a, an old, a, a new bolt in it, or does it have an old bolt that's square head? Oh, we'd like you to load test old square head bolts, or as soon as you change it to a new hex head bolt, and you got silicone in here, Let's move on to the next one. Oh, on this Springer connection right here. Is it all new bolts on the Springer connection? Is it sealed? Oh, great. You don't have to load test that. All the treads and on every component, every component on the car seat is covered. Food and cantilevers. And ladder. So, yes, the state should jump in and normalize this whole thing. But Lowell can't wait. They just did it. Malden can't wait. They just did it. So, yes, I, I would state The problem with that is, I learned from a, an old time building commission on a wall on the back row. See, stick to your papers in the code. That's not in my code. I know. That's important. As great an idea as it is, but if you court, if you think about the real thing, you know, the legal action, if you take some of the court on that, we lose. Because, because they would say, this building commission, where is that? What, what, you know, what CMR? You quote and it's not CMR, like you said, the state puts out for Boston, and a lot of the cities copy the Boston certificate. The Boston is different. They do what they want anyway. Guys, I know. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just telling you that there's a, there's a solution out there, and the state wants to get involved with the solution and basically create a standardized 25 point questionnaire that comes out. Because listen, it's not just global, it's. Um, it's Yonkers, same 25 questions. It's Seattle, right? It's Tacoma. It's Jersey City and Worcester. So, guys, I don't want to say that the state has to get involved. I'm just saying, yes, the state should get involved. Because a lot of these, a lot of these guys are just going questions. Um, well, I'm all flooded, okay? I think this is the now that picture that you have of those, the young girl and, and her mother who walked, yeah. she lost her life. She lost her life 40 something years ago. Uh, did anybody go to jail for that? To my knowledge, in that story, nobody went to jail. So, the owners or the owner of the building, nothing happened. Right? To my knowledge, yes. Yeah. Awesome. I, I didn't know, that's why I'm asking. And my point is this, 
You have all the specs and inspections in the world that you can find people who are the owners of the building or who are responsible for the maintenance. But until you put somebody in jail, and I mean in jail, not all right, in a place where they obviously a state prison, you're not gonna get anything. All right? I wanna see that. I'll tell you one thing. Um, so yeah. I had a son or a daughter or a grandchild that was killed in a fire escape that was never maintained, only to be repaired. You know what? I'm going to pay the prison. <laughs> so, I don't care what anybody thinks. But until these people go to jail, you're going to get no cooperation from the owners. So as they say, don't shoot the messenger. But guys, this is a national, this is a national problem. I agree. The state should be involved in standardizing some of these things. Every local building official, you keep it simple. Ask for one of these. I don't care what kind of paper you get with it. This may, this puts somebody in a, in a situation where they're going to lie. I'm just trying to give you 25 questions that make people lie. And the guy that signs off on this is usually a third party inspector who's going to lie as insurance. And he may or may not go to jail because if you lie on the document, that's where the city can come in and say, you lied and told me this was ready for tenants and firemen and everybody, and a fireman and that holding a baby died on this. You know what I'm saying? And I have a document here with 25 standardized questions that came from a, the state, and it says these are these are just standard questions to be asked about a specific fire escape. You start getting into a barn or something else, and the questions don't belong to barn, they belong. So that's all this was. Is the conference that is now nationwide and you voluntarily. None of these are state. This is just a standard questionnaire for fire states only. Okay? And then you look at different states that's incorporated in fire state repairs into their website, which is Portland, Oregon. Right? New York. Who's inspecting these fire escapes? Right? Who's inspecting other fire escapes? I'm hammer testing. See my three pound head? Let they, the, the, the structural engineer on this says, fix one tread and scrape it and paint it. Right? This is his thing. Do these four things which scrape and paint it. And I, I had to, I had to, see all the reds? Those are all life safeties. They shut down this whole building. By the way, the unique thing about this building here was Hollywood in the east. This is in, in, uh, um, in Jersey, northern New Jersey, I forgot the name now, uh, but to accompany me. But this is where Hollywood, the, the speakeasies, was in this in this building. So all the speakeasy movies, uh, not speakeasy, uh, silent movie. This was the East Coast Hollywood. It was at this location. But now it's just a big storage place. But this this whole fire escape was fully uh, not certified. But yet I had an engineer. This another engineer, another engineer said this fire escape only needs scrape and paint. In my visit there, I was pulling bolts off of this thing with my hand. But yet, um, the, the document that he gave me said, just scrape it and paint it. There's another one, it's missing a rail at the very top. A woman fell and died, this is in Boston. She fell from that top floor. Actually, I'm sorry, the story was, it's still a woman, but this is a five story, because they don't, this is a five story next to another five story, but this five story met their rooftop. So guess what, this person who was in this apartment building used to hang out every night after, after clubbing and drinking on the rooftop. And then when the phone rang, they ran back with the missing railway at the top. And they fell just to the right of the walkway back to the building. Five stories, sitting around. There's another one, Blackstone. They, they got fixed, did a roof, put the fire escape back, took the roof off with this kid, put the fire escape back on, and what, what do men do when we have bolts that we're changing, the, doing our engine repair? Uh, what do we do with the extra bolts, guys? We save it for the next engine repair because obviously that engine didn't need all those bolts. Right? So again, same thing here. And look, it slid off the fire escape. They had five people on this thing that were, that were buying and selling the condo, and they all slid and landed on one roof below. So that was caused by human weight on it that got the attached so they back to the roof. Okay? Witnesses say it sounded like an incredible explosion when the fire escape of a Philadelphia apartment building suddenly collapsed and injured three people. NBC 10 cameras were there as a friend holds on to one of the victim's hands, who is apparently conscious as the victim is placed into an ambulance by medics.
KYWTV reports a man who was critically injured and two women were rushed to local hospitals. Police believe the bolts of the fire escape appear to have been rusted and dislodged from the brick wall of the apartment building. The victims fell more than 30 feet to the ground and now the incident is under investigation. Worth noting, the complex is more than 100 years old and even on Philadelphia's historic registry. Local reporters are all pointing out the city's licenses and inspections department hasn't filed any violations in the past when it comes to the old building. So Sunday's collapse came without warning. Neighbors say the three victims, reportedly all in their 20s, may have been partying on the fire escape landing before the incident. For Newsy, I'm Elizabeth Hagedorn. So this is at Philadelphia, and over there they haven't inspected fire escapes. Ever. So what do they have now? They want only structural engineers to inspect fire escapes. So that's one of the reasons. Here my FSCs, again being an expert witness, and I was on this case, the, the key here is that at the very top where it, it came off four stories up above, all three got hurt, one died. So the key while I'm showing you this is because the through bolts got eaten into the building. So it's not that the fire escape failed, it's that the connections, the through bolts into the building were eaten by water. <coughs> So due to time, we're trying to address this. This would be just another fire escape of Walker in New York City. Fire escapes are supposed to be a safe way out in emergencies, but some experts say some fire escapes are themselves a danger that puts people at risk. CBS 2's Marsha Kramer demanding answers tonight. You see the train already dislodged by itself? How much rust is inside that? I wouldn't go on this fire escape. It was an eye-popping afternoon with nationally recognized fire escape expert Cisco Manessis. Come over here and look straight up. There's a hole. As we walked the streets in downtown Manhattan, it was also too easy to spot dangerous conditions. Should involved. this fire escape have violations? Yes. It has been kept painted, but it's not structurally sound. Heavy rust was clearly visible, and something else we saw over and over again, air conditioners. That's an obstruction for the firemen to get in, as well as the people to get out. Any obstruction, from flower pots to art installations, can impede a safe escape in an emergency. But even more frightening, the structural integrity of fire escapes designed to save lives Lives in some cases has proven deadly. Earlier this year in Soho, a tread fell from this fire escape and killed one pedestrian and injured another. And in May of 2011, an entire platform gave way from this Midtown building. You can see here the evidence of corrosion. That's what caused the, the platform to fail. Attorney Herb Cabrera says the victim fell 12 feet and needed multiple surgeries. The building eventually settled the lawsuit for millions. You got to live with pain for the rest of your life. According to the Department of Buildings, there are about 200,000 fire escapes in the city, and they are all required to be maintained by building owners. In building six stories and above, fire escapes and building facades are inspected by the DOB every five years. We have a limited number of inspectors in the city. We do the best that we can. And they were clearly concerned when we showed them some of what we found. This is a clamp. How do you feel about that? It's holding the fire escape together. That's an unacceptable condition. So what about situations where you have clearly rusted out parts? We will write violations for failure to maintain when we run into those conditions. This year, there were more than 5,311 complaints to the DOB, as well as the Department of Housing Preservation and Development and the Fire Department, who also does regular inspections to make sure firefighters are safe. If you feel a fire escape is, is dangerous uh, or unsafe, we don't expect our members to, to go on. The fire department says they will put up ladders or find another way in. Firefighters have been uh, seriously injured on fire escapes previously. There's a dear price to pay when an owner does not carefully maintain the fire escape. The fire escapes on some of the buildings can be 75 to 100 years old. Our expert told us that some of the bolts holding them up have never been replaced. If you see a dangerous situation, call 311. I'm Marcia Kramer, CBS 2 News. Okay, so this is another Iowa. The fire seat was black, hold into the building, fell to the ground, curtains almost killed students. Then they put it back. It was all lag holding, not through holding. So how many of your fire escapes are lag holding? There was some. How do we know it's lag holding? When you see four to six bolts on a bracket, not just one through bolt, it's lag holding. 
So that's why you use a lot when you don't have a throughput back in the building. No parsing can ever be just live over in the building. This is where they threw the evidence in a field like five blocks away. They threw the whole thing that collapsed to the ground while waiting for court cases and stuff that were going to feel. And it's here that when we went there, we found the lag bulb still in the bracket. They put it back, and they were so unsure of themselves with through bolts, they actually put a leg on the, on the roof. So they doubled up to make sure it never would fall again. And did they have a sleeper on the roof, or did they just have the pole sticking in the, uh, in the shingle? Right? Right, today's COVID. Today's COVID did what the fire escapes? Every building now is no smoking. So every fire escape is now what? It's this new smoking room. Every fire escape is a smoking room. So, I know. And just so you know, there's a new show coming out where it's about how much uh, activity goes on through the fire escapes, you know, with people sleeping with each other and just all kinds of murder. And there's a new show coming out. And this is exactly what it's there. Lots happen on that fire escape, but they don't mention collapse and kill and murder and, and you know, fatalities. They don't mention that. They, these fire escapes are 75 to 125 years old and never inspected. Boston says that only out of 9,000, only 3,000 in the history of certifications have ever been certified. Your cities are the same, if not worse. Because they have an enforcement to a certain degree there. Okay? So you guys remember this. So don't forget, fire escapes have murder rates and kill rates. This is one of my, uh, this is not the actual picture of the guy, but one of my guys in Chicago, his father, because he's seven years old, fell seven stories for, to his death fixing the fire escape. So it's a, it's a deck of cards. If you don't know what you're doing, you move. sadly pull the wrong piece or rely on a piece that you think is going to hold it, it's not going to hold it. So it'll kill the head, it doesn't discriminate. It'll, the fire escape will kill anybody. All right, what you don't see is what's inside the wall. So behind the veneer, which is not structural, is the structural. So veneer brick, beautiful veneer brick, behind it is the two to three layers of brick, which is structural. So that's why fire escape steel is embedded eight to 12 inches deep. Okay, so what you see behind there is what's starting to rot out, because a lot of times that half inch space between the veneer and the brick, the brick inside the structural, has water coming down from a leak in the roof for how many years? 75 to 125 years. So what happens is a bolt is supposed to look like this. You know, the true bolt into the building is supposed to look like this. Look at these pictures. Instead, they look like this. Because the bolt outside looks great. The inside doesn't look great. So what happens? That's the part that the low test is going to catch. So let me fly in because I want to hold you guys for lunch. So, a lot of it happens behind the scenes, you can't see this stuff, okay? A lot of it happens inside the walls, you can't see it, low tests take care of any deficiencies in a wall. Can a whole fire escape collapse? Never. Every four feet there's a redundancy. Can a piece of it tilt, drop, or whatever? The answer is yes. That's why you do a pre-low test evaluation. You never low test a fire escape that cannot pass a theoretical low test, meaning every connection has no rust, all the connections in the fire escape are in good condition with either a very tight original square head bolt or it's got a new bolt. If it's got a new bolt, there is no need for a low test at that time because the NFPA said the authority having jurisdiction shall accept by low test on other evidence of strength. You're in, as soon as you change the bolt, you're in other evidence of strength plans. Okay? This is the first fire tower in the nation that got its raised. The railings raised to 42. Okay? And uh, they also Low test, I've never in my whole life ever low tested a tower. So in Bowman, we low tested this two fire, two fire escapes on either side. They got low tested. What is low testing? Well, it's a combination of bags, or you can do one of these. Ready? This is how fast we are right here. This is time lapse, obviously. And as you can see, it's all up. So you can keep your weights down on the ground and then use a combination of cables and yank, yank. So this is probably four hours worth of work. If you want those buckets have 15 pounds of sand and, low, and lead weight inside, you have to move them around and basically get the thing. So, okay. So this is my evil clean rubber. Still there. This is also low testing. So, again, uh, commercial property, one, one balcony only. 
using sandbags. So sandbags, water bags, weights. And the accordion ladder needs to be dropped and the cables need to be changed. And you observe, but if you have to observe a thousand pounds, 400 pounds to begin with, measure before, during, and after. Then you observe the full weight of a thousand pounds, measure before, during, and after. This usually takes about 30 minutes per pull. You can single pull a bracket, or you can single pull uh, uh, two brackets side by side using an aluminum ID between the two. So this is from start to finish, throw everything back in the van. Perfect. All right, let's move it up. Low testing, same stories, same thing. It's just you can bring all this weight up, or you can you can use a, a cabling system. I needed a dead weight at the bottom, so we use the tail end of the truck. Farscape is pre-load test evaluated to make sure it's going to pass. So nobody will load test Farscape just off the bat. You have to sign and have a document that says pre-load test evaluation says that this Farscape is certifiable. Theoretically, now practically, we're going we're gonna to throw weights on it and prove it. Okay? So theoretical is opinions, and practical is you put the physical weight on it. Okay? Oh, this is a Harvard University Farscape. This is sandbag, so you have a choice to also drag the sandbags all the way to the top floor, right? And then start cascading these things down the ground. So there you go. How many men? About seven men. How, well, how long the whole day? Drag all these bags to the very top, start cascading them down, right? And then uh, measure before, during, and after. These things fall all over the place. It's a nightmare. By the way, your own weight is part of the load test, so how dangerous is this way of doing it? Okay? That doesn't seem to say. Just do a test like that, I wouldn't I know, but that's what they want. That's how the old way to do it. We don't do that. I did this for a purpose of showing you guys. The old way of doing it, you drag all your weight to the very top, 2,500 pounds on that platform up above, and start cascading some, some bags down the stairs. You need a bunch of men. You need all day. We've, Increase the formulization of what needs to be done because a lot of the weight of the ground now can be done, but it involves calculations, it involves cables, it involves theoretical uh, manipulation of the physics. This is the fireman that I that I that I did uh, that got hurt. He fell through. This is the actual building. Um, three of these treads got up. Three years later, when the lawsuits finally go, they brought they brought me in. That they had firefighters, building inspectors, lawyers. They only fixed those three threads. The rest of the fire escape failed miserably as I was pulling up. I had stepping on it. The treads were fired. The rest of the treads that they didn't, they didn't do, right? They started falling. They quickly uh, settled the case right after that because it just didn't make any sense what they were trying to do. All right, so let's do this way. We got the raffle. I got five minutes uh, or, or while she's doing the raffle. We got any questions. And if you guys want, I have a certificate for you that makes you a specialist now, a co-specialist when it comes to Farscape because of today's class. Yeah, okay. This is for the uh, trip to Hawaii. I'll pay by the state. I didn't pay it all. So we'll get you to Hawaii. Yeah, all right. All right. Ready? 911. 871. 911. 871. And I believe we're at lunchtime. I'm going to be here for another 15 minutes and a half hour. If anybody wants to come see Russ, talk to me before you chew or get in line. I'm going to be here. Thank you very much, guys, for the class. We have a winner. We got $150 for the trip to Hawaii. Oh, all the Thank you.